Welkom bij Nachtraaf. Een podcast voor, door en over mensen actief achter de schermen van de showbiz. Showbiz, 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 showbiz. Hallo, welkom alweer bij een nieuwe aflevering van Nachtraaf. Vandaag wordt een speciale aflevering omdat we deze voor een keer in het Engels zullen doen. Dat heeft alles te maken met onze gast vanavond. Ze woont ondertussen in Antwerpen, is volop Nederlands aan het leren, maar is oorspronkelijk van Engeland. Anyway, let's switch to English. Our guest today is one of the most talented and successful show and production designers of this era. To say, in, to say it in her own words, she's passionate about storytelling and has a flair for melding performance and design. Her show designs encompass lighting and set design, and on many of these events, she's also the, light, the lighting director and operator. She's a four-time Night of Elimination Award winner and was on the shortlist for at least four TPI awards. If this doesn't impress you enough, then her client list definitely will. Not only has she worked with a lot of renowned artists such as Ellie Golding, Elbow, Editors and George Ezra, but also with several Belgian success stories like Angel, Bazaar and Oscar and the Wolf. Beside, b- beside all that, she's also one of the founders of Bright Design in Birmingham, whose references are even more extensive than the few I already named. This introduction has left me a little bit in awe, so just let me say this. Welcome, Kate Carter. Hello. Hi, Kate. So nice to have you today. Nice intro, uh, Peter. Well, thank yes. you very much. Your English is impressive. <laughs> I try. <laughs> okay, so we'll start off with a few short questions. Okay. Um, what do you prefer, a big festival or a small intimate session? Festival. Um, continental or English breakfast? Continental. Um, design or operate? Design. The ferry or the train? Train. <laughs> Um, who's your favorite artist? Still Radiohead. Still Radiohead, nice. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite Belgian beer? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, at home, I drink a lot of safe in the summer. A lot of what? Safe. Antwerp beer. Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't know it. I feel, <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I feel like a, a, mm, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, I do enjoy Belgian beer, generally speaking, but I still feel like I've got quite a lot to discover. But uh, yeah, Le Chouf, uh, Saif. Uh, Chouf? Le, yeah, Le Chouf. You like it? Yeah, I do. <laughs> you like Duvel? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Your favorite city <laughs> in the world? Oh, my, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, that is a really good question. <laughs> I'd probably say Ljubljana. Okay. Uh, the obvious thing would be to say somewhere like New York, which is brilliant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but actually, I think from like days off in places, it's always exciting to go to Ljubljana. Where's that? In Slovenia. Whoa. It's really small and, well, I... I My perception is it's really small. There might be some Slovenian people who would disagree. But it's so sort of small <laughs> and cozy and beautiful. And yeah, it's, it's uh, nice. You, you you ended up there for doing a, a gig or something? or Yeah, yeah, it's odd actually. Because, um, you know, like you, you sort of, the unpredictability of touring routes, sometimes you go to the same city 15 times and you never see anything other than the venue. Mm-hmm. And then other times you always have a day off in the same. And Ljubljana yeah. has been that for me. Like festival or show, we've always ended up with a day off. And uh, oh, okay. a chance to explore summer, winter. It's just a really beautiful little gem in there. All right. Cool. Yeah, highly recommended <laughs> for a weekend away when we can do that again. Good job. Yeah. Um, the best live gig you ever saw? Oh, um, oh gosh. Uh, oh, that's a good one. Uh, what would it be? Can I do three that come to mind? So like going back, the first gig that kind of blew me away was seeing Radiohead in South Park, which was probably in 2001, I think. And that was when I sort of thought, ah, this is what I want to do for a a living. And then probably more recently, Massive Attack and um, LCD Sound System are like probably two highlights (laughs) in recent years. I'm just like, yeah. Cool. 
I couldn't pick one, but yeah, um, of course, three is better. <laughs> That's always a hard uh, actually, question, a, actually a stupid so. question, I <laughs> <laughs> Um Who's the best light designer in the world, by your opinion? Goodness me. Um, I was thinking about this before driving here. I thought, I bet you're going to ask me this. And again, I'm going to want to give you more than one answer, which I don't know if that's... Uh, um, I've always, yeah, I've said this before, um, always been really inspired by uh, the work of Andy Watson and his his um, his projects over the years. Um, and there's loads of brilliant lighting designers currently. Um, at the moment, Rob Sinclair does some pretty, pretty incredible work. Um, Yeah, to buy a Sri Lanka. Can well, you? So. Can you? Um, because uh, the the world of uh, light designer is not really uh, our, <laughs> our world. <laughs> can you? I show you five minutes of a show. Can you say oh, that's his work? That's his work. That's. Can you? Is sometimes, it like, yeah? sometimes from a photo. Yeah, yeah, because because people have got a signature style, mm -hmm. and it's not always obvious. But certainly with certain designers who I think are quite prolific currently, um, some people have quite a strong signature style and you can look at it and go, I, I'm pretty sure it's their show. And uh, with a little bit of research, it's... Yeah. And do you have like guys that are like uh, very famous, they do a lot of uh, big acts, let's say like that, but that you say it's always horrible? <laughs> <laughs> is there like the, the <laughs> I don't know yeah. that you dangerous question well, but no, but without naming names of course well design's subjective so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know I think that's the beauty of it you can um, see some things that you think is incredible and, and not everybody will share that opinion and then you can see other things which are heralded as being really prolific work and also be a bit kind of like okay well mm, yeah Okay. No. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, these questions sh should go fast at 10 questions. Huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. We still have the first 10. We're, we're already <laughs> at the last one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. uh, English or Nederlands? Ah, uh, yeah. I can't Nederlands say it. But Engels is gemakkelijker. <laughs> Not for me. I hope one day my, uh, my Dutch will be fluent, but uh, for now I'm still... I think you're doing great already. <laughs> Trying, but yeah. Absolutely. Dutch is a very hard language yeah. to learn. Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it a hard they language? They told me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kate, is it, is it a hard language to learn? I think it's really hard, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there seems to be so many exceptions. Just when you think you've got the hang of it, someone's like, ah, no, no. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's taken me a long time, but I just don't think I've got a particularly good aptitude for learning languages, so that's probably not helping matters. <laughs> no. But language is so... Imp is it... Is it? How is it for you to live in... Uh, now, you, you, you have been living in Antwerp for... Eight years. For eight years already. How difficult is it to live in a city not and not speaking the native language for you? I think it, I think it's a bit double, really. Like on the one hand, I was really lucky moving here um, because I've, almost everybody speaks really good English. So on the one hand, you don't feel alienated because you can communicate with everyone in your mother tongue. And I I really appreciate how lucky I am to be in that situation. You know, a lot of people, you know, certainly the, the courses I've been doing, a lot of people don't have that advantage um but the flip side of that is it does make it harder to learn because you never find yourself in that kind of immersive you know sink or swim you yeah. need to learn it to be understood because yeah, yeah. you can be quite lazy and always sink back to your uh yeah your first language um before i moved here um in the years the years before when i was touring a lot in europe but living in the uk I always wanted to have a second language and it frustrated me that I didn't. And I kind of always realized in myself that I would never master having a second language without living mm -hmm. somewhere where I needed to learn one. Yeah, sure. My intention was definitely that I would have learned Dutch a lot quicker than... <laughs> like, eight years. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'll have this nailed in a couple of years and here I am eight years later. But, you know. But it's true for us. Um, to be... Yeah, and maybe for the listeners that are, uh, uh, yeah, for the people that are listening, yeah, my English, for example, it's not so good, but pff, I don't really care. Uh, 
It's I say a lot of uh, stupid things, I think, in English, but uh, yeah. And I think that's, I at some point I, I, I made the switch in my head, like, or I don't speak, <laughs> which is difficult for me, <laughs> or, uh, but I just, you know, I, I told you, I, I told you guys earlier, I, um, I started working, um, oh, I don't know. I have been working for French artists uh, uh, quite a lot the last well, maybe 10, 15 years. And um, I really liked it. I have always liked it. But in the beginning, the language was for me, uh, yeah, very difficult. I definitely find when I work with a French production, I feel more embarrassed by the fact I can't speak French. Yeah. Um, and also we learned French at school. You know, it's not that we don't get language education in the UK. We absolutely do. But what I find fascinating um, is that at school leaving age, you can pass your exams in your second language and not be fluent. Uh, so yeah, obviously yeah. the standards yeah. are completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, yeah, I ended up in, in Paris with like really nice people. But when they when we were at in, in a restaurant, I always felt felt a little bit alienated yeah. because yeah, yeah I, I didn't understand the jokes. I, I and I was I, I felt that I was yeah I'm not I'm gonna, not gonna say I was like lonely, but I was I these in these years I for me it was difficult to be in the place like it really and at some point I just decided oh fuck it yeah and I had a I had a, a friend tour manager uh, uh, that was that uh, with who I did a lot of uh, things and we had like the deal that. Like, yeah, Frank, just talk in French. You say a lot of stupid things, <laughs> but uh, I'll just correct you. And we had like that kind of deal. And for me, it, yeah, it helped me a lot. I'm not going to say that my French is now like top level, but... Uh, but, yeah. But it's yeah. way better than language is, is a, it's a it's a strange thing. Eh? Uh, yeah, and I think because I've never spoken a second language, um, I've spent, you know, I learned the very basics in Dutch when I first moved and then never really found the time to pursue lessons or a course. So it was always just like pigeon bits and pieces, like phrases and words. Because, I, I, you know, I don't want to walk into, you know, outside of our sector, like in a just day-to-day -day environment, I don't want to walk into the bank or a shop and just start speaking English. I find that incredibly rude. So I'd sort of picked up quite quickly how to establish the fact in Dutch that my Dutch isn't very good and can we please speak English and is it okay for you? But I never really got past that. And... This year, one of the you know, few advantages to being at home for the whole year is I've been able to to study and follow like intensive language courses. And there definitely was that point where around close friends um, and family, it's like, OK, I'm just going to go for it. And I'm not embarrassed anymore about making mistakes, whereas previously I was uh, quite sort of, you know, afraid. Of I think like Frank said, it's... Uh the moment, the moment you pass that border that you're not embarrassed anymore to speak a language that's not your first, I think that's the moment you start learning a lot because you're just trying and you're doing it and... Finding your way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. And hopefully that will start to come more in the next few months. But um, it, it's the what I notice now is the, the, the difference is being able to sort of like uh, on day-to-day -day things complete transactions with people in Dutch, which is great. You know, okay, you go to the bank or you go to the pharmacy or the doctor or whatever, and you, you, I don't need to use English anymore. But to articulate myself, like now, I'm, I'm still just nowhere near there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like, it, it, friends are very patient. And you can see them there going, okay, can you just get to the, should we, do, could, in English. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so. yeah, 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 but that's the thing, eh? And certainly in, in the work situation, because yeah, a lot of times yeah, we work in kind of a international yeah, that's the thing, yeah. environment. So yeah, there's always a French guy in the team or always a, yeah, I don't you, know. Yeah. Yeah, if you Different. were to work at yeah, a so bank English, or anything English in Belgium. Is, a, yeah. is, a, is the language of the business, I think. Yeah, and I think I've never true. made a, a, a real a, a problem of it. To say like speaking English, yeah, for me, if... For people, uh, I, I, it's a good question. Is it frustrating for you guys when you no. you suddenly forced into speaking English all the time when you're at a festival? Absolutely or? not. Oh no, or for me, no. absolutely not. No, for me neither. No. But I think sure, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's really different because we grew up watching TV in English or American. Uh, we read a lot in English because all of the manuals, all stuff is in English. Um, Ninety percent of the internet is in English, so we automatically from a young age adapted to a second language like English and that's 
a whole other thing than learning a language at your 16 or 20 years old that you never use. We use it every day. So I think that's, that's, that's a big difference. Okay. So, hey, these 10 questions done? <laughs> <laughs> so now the second part. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, who is Kate Carter? Where did she grow up? Uh, I grew up in a small town called Hawley, which is south of London. It's uh, southeast England, about yeah, halfway between London and Brighton. So quite a four hour drive from here. Oh, really? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, if, uh, if you know, the borders are open. And <laughs> no Brexit. Yeah, and no Brexit things. and all of that stuff. So yeah, quite, quite close. Um, and uh, so you grew up in a small uh, city? Yeah. Close to London? Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about <laughs> that. Yeah, but not not like no, no. <laughs> just. But how did you? How how was it to to grow up there? And at what point did you run away? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, I went to yeah. Grew up, grew up in a small town, um, and London was our biggest city. Uh, so kind of when we got to college age and we're going out, we'd go to gigs in London um, oh. or Brighton. Um, and I stayed there till I was 17 and then I got an opportunity to work for an audio company in Bristol in Southwest England. So I moved at 17 to the Southwest and stayed there until a couple of years before I came to Belgium. And sort uh, of so but <laughs> this is going to open some more yeah. questions. Oh, you. <laughs> it's very interesting. You ended up at an audio company. Wow, we love it. <laughs> no, but... So how did, yeah, you were 17 years old. Uh, uh, how did I yeah, end up working yeah, in, 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 uh, in Bristol for the sound company? <laughs> yeah, so I started in audio. I don't know if you knew that. No? <laughs> there you go. Um, it's not on your website. <laughs> damn it. Should have, should have, the resume doesn't go back that far. Um, yeah, so I was at college um, in the town I grew up in, or a nearby town, and I studied music technology, theatre, music, um, I said music, um, theatre and media. And uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll try and do the abridged version so we're not here all night. We had a, uh, I wanted to work in radio. That was my dream when I was a teenager. I was like, radio is where it's at. I love music. I like the studio environment. But I had my sights on that. And the college I went to had a new music technology department and performing arts department. And a lot of my friends were studying. So I was spending a lot of time in the studio at lunch times. So I decided the following year to, to start doing music tech. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed learning about all of the you know, aspects of sort of software and uh, studio hardware and stuff. And uh, we had this really cool teacher called Lloyd, and he was very, very inspiring, um, like bleach blonde hair, surfer. He played in like an 80s synth duo uh, in untold like lycra outfits and stuff. <laughs> and and uh, he, he, was, he was brilliant. Actually, interestingly, in the years since I left college, I've run into other people in the sector who are now working professionally as musicians or in sound who've all been through his course. So he's obviously inspired loads of young people to go into live audio. Cool. And um, he, he basically said to me, I remember this really clearly, whatever you do, do not go into live. Absolutely. <laughs> Terrible idea. The hours are awful. The pay is not much better. Um, you, need, you need to go into studio engineering. That's, that's where the future is. And with that, he was also like, and don't go to university. I'm sure the college hated this, but he was he, half of our lessons were in the pub as well. I just to put this in context, you know, when we weren't in the studio, we were learning theory in the pub. And he was like, university, complete waste of time. You need to get a job making tea in a studio in London. And that is how you're going to get into being a successful producer or studio engineer. So we're all sort of 17 years old and like, oh, this guy's amazing. And uh, that summer, I was working at a, a small festival in the town that I went to college in and I was selling ice cream and, and crepes, I think, or something. And uh, there was a stage and some live music. And I remember watching, I was very bored. Nobody was buying ice cream. It's England, it's raining. And I'm just watching these guys pushing speakers past me every day. And I'm like, the, the words are going around in my head. Lloyd, don't go to university. Go and get some work experience. I completely forgot the bit about don't go into live. <laughs> and uh, ended up chatting to these guys and and 
long, long story short, I ended up doing an internship with their company and I moved over to Bristol and started working for them. Um, and like, I, I mean, to say I... But that's young, eh? G moving yeah. away from your family, yeah, I presume uh, at 17 years old and Jesus. To go work in the life uh, <laughs> yeah. music yeah. industry. Yeah, that's... yeah, my family were amazingly supportive, but when I talk to my mum about it now, there are definitely moments where she's like, it was young. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. And it was a quick decision as well. It was kind of like, mum, I've got this job offer. I'm going. But you, so at that point you didn't finish high school. Or was I, it, or, or was I finished high school um, and I suppose when I was at high school I probably would have planned to go to university and then I, I didn't really know what direction to study and then so I took a gap year started working for an audio company and yeah um, that it, was that <laughs> that was that okay. yeah 18 years later it's still still doing and when did you then make the switch from that internship to maybe something else or, or light designing or? So like the first couple of years I worked with them, it was kind of, you know, ad hoc work. Um, and you know, I had no training. I was really young. So it was kind of warehouse work, you know, sweeping the floor, coiling cables, making tea, packing trucks, just hanging out with it, working hard, but also just hanging around people, mixing and doing the jobs I wanted to do to try and learn as much as possible. And, um, I started as like a camera operator and stage tech. Um, and I, it was difficult at first to get enough work to survive purely off of gig work. So I was kind of waitressing on the side. And I, I figured out pretty quickly that if I helped the lighting guys put the rig in, I'd get an extra two days work at the beginning of every booking and an extra day at the end taking it out. So I wasn't particularly interested in lighting, <laughs> but I desperately needed to find a way of um, earning a bit more money to pay my rent. So I basically started going and, and doing the lighting load ins and load outs and then switching to the audio team during the festival. And I don't know, it was probably around the time where I'd gone back to college at this point and was doing music tech again to try and learn Pro Tools and Logic and, and sort of have, have a, a small solid skills as well as, as working on gigs. And um, I, I got an opportunity to kind of run lights for, I don't know, I think it was like some corporate Christmas parties or something like that from a friend of mine. He, he was booked to do it and he couldn't do it. So he said, well, could you cover for me? I was like, well, I, I, Paddy, I don't, I don't know how to use a lighting desk. Oh, it's fine, I'll program it. You just need to, you know, <laughs> like here's the colors, flash some lights, yeah. e exactly that. And around that time, I was getting to the point where it, during, you know, if, if we were doing a small festival, maybe on a Sunday morning, the house band were sound checking, the front of house guy might just throw me on the mixer while he was getting a coffee and say like, have a go. And the problem I was finding is I'd, I'd spent, by this point, three years at college learning what everything did on a mixing desk or what everything did in these racks. So I kind of knew the theory, but when I'd stand in front of a mixer, I was like, oh, I don't, yeah, yeah. I think people would try and encourage me like, oh, you know, what, what do you think of the snare drum? What sort of EQ? And I'm like, honestly, I haven't got a clue. Like, it's a snare drum. What do you want me to do with it? And it was, <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of at that point, I was like, mm. I just, I just didn't have that spark with, you know, I, I put my heart and soul into learning sound because I loved the environment. I've loved live music, but I just, it, it didn't come naturally to me. And the first day on a lighting desk, I was like, it was that, was that this, this is great. Yeah. This yeah. is, yeah. And hey, but at, at, at the point where you felt like, oh shit, it's not me. Was it like a big disappointment? Yeah. That, that feeling like, oh, just, yeah. I, you were chasing your dream and then. The dream well, wasn't... And I wouldn't say it happened... Like, I, I can say this now with the benefit of hindsight, because I wouldn't say it happened overnight. It wasn't like, oh, I've dreamed for this moment and it's just not working for me. It probably happened over the course of six months. And I was... I knew I was about to make the step up into having to learn to, to mix sound, not just watch other people doing it. And I mean, when I say getting the opportunity, we, you know, we'd be doing a, like one of the... We'd, we'd do like um, hard house and techno weekenders at holiday camps and I would get given the, the teeny, teeny, tiny room with the DJ and two faders and a couple of monitors and just don't let it feed back, you know, yeah. really, really little yeah. jobs. Um, and I was finding it hard, but also I was probably 19 and I was kind of thinking, well, maybe it is just hard because it's new and I need to keep working at this and it will get better. And so you don't know necessarily that you're not any good at it. You just know that you're finding it really difficult and scary. Oh, yeah. And at the same time, because I kind of strolled into running a lighting desk for the first time without any pressure, because I didn't have any aspirations to do lighting. 
um, I found myself in this situation where there'd be a, a band playing and it would be like, oh, yeah, this might look good. Yeah, well, why not? Let's see what it looks like. And it, it, over the, the following months, I really had this sort of internal kind of dilemma of, am I quitting on sound because it's, be, because it's become difficult? You know, is it just that I've hit a hurdle, which I need to work through and I'm running away from it? Or is it just that I have more of an aptitude for lighting than sound? Mm -hmm. And over the course of a few months and probably a lot of beers with a lot of friends going, what should I do? Uh, I decided, yeah, that lighting was definitely my, oh, cool. my Interesting. thing. So, it turned out yeah. to be a, a good choice, I think. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think you've proven yeah. that already. That's I was well. a terrible sound engineer. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a, I am a terrible light engineer. <laughs> <laughs> And where where uh, where did you go from there? Did you say to the company you were working for then, I want to do lights and no sound anymore? Or? Yeah, so, so the, luckily enough, and the reason I got that opportunity was the company I was working for. It was a company called Southwest Audio in Bristol. Um, and they, they were primarily a sound company, but they had lighting and they had some video equipment. So within their teams, it was possible to kind of shift over. And I carried on with them for a couple of years and then um, started freelancing and working more um, for... I ended up working quite a lot for a couple of corporate companies in London and other other lighting companies in the UK, mostly initially doing festival work um, and events work. Uh, I found it quite hard to get into touring at first. So um, I would say it was probably five years. I, I mean, I can't remember the exact timeline, but five years from starting my internship to actually doing my first tour which in hindsight is not that long at all, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at the time in your early, you know, and you're so, you know, you're 20, 21 and you're just yeah. impatient and you want to get out there and you want to do it. And initially it was difficult to get touring work because I was young. I hadn't got touring work on, on my CV and you'd go to people and say, Hey, I do lights and I do the lights for this stage at this festival. And they'd be like, yeah, who have you toured with? Well, I, I haven't yet. Yeah. Well, no. You know, and, and it, it, it was two years really of that, just every time. Trying and not getting anything yeah. more, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or the, the bands that you might have access to who were small enough not to have a lighting designer wouldn't have room in the splitter to bring you along to do lights, even though you'd be yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'll do it for free. There just wasn't a seat in the van or... Yeah, yeah. That's, that's different with, with, sound, with a, a career of a sound engineer. In an early stage of a of an artist or a band, they need or they take a sound engineer first, and, and you can sound, easily yeah. make your first yeah. also your yeah. first steps with a with a, a, a young a young artist a, a young band. But yeah, I can imagine for as a light engineer, yeah, you're not the first one to hire. You're not even the second one. No, you're quite you're you're, you're, you're quite late in the process. And then, yeah, at that point, you are there's more at stake. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I, I suppose you know, in those early days. Um, ex-boyfriend of mine um, was a sound is still a sound engineer and you know he would be working for bands who wouldn't have a lighting designer so I might go along to the London show and there might be 12 park hands and then I'd be like right I'll do the lights for you but that just wasn't enough um and interesting you say about the increments of it like you see it now with video crew you know like you say you're a band starting out you might start with a front of house engineer who sets up the back line and then you might get a backliner and a tour manager and a monitor engineer and you you build your team and At a certain point when you're playing clubs, you'll probably bring in your own lighting designer. But how many video directors have gone and toured with bands who are doing 1,000 club shows? Yeah. It, you know, None. I do, yeah. Their entry levels generally arena, you know, or big yeah, festivals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's interesting how the departments have a completely different, I think. Yeah, that, that's true. I think so. Uh, I think so as well. But yeah, the, the, always the first, the first step is always... The hardest, I think. Eh? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Did you see a lot of change the the on the moment you got your first tour? Yeah, a hundred percent. So I was really lucky. Um, there was um, a, a British lighting designer called Brian Leach, who um, sadly passed away last year, but was very um, very talented and very quite acclaimed, I suppose. You know, he he worked with a lot of people. He used to used to be Coldplay's lighting designer, um, Kylie Minogue, Justin Timberlake, um, and he was. <laughs> yeah, so you know, he, he was doing huge shows, um, but he was also he had a he had his own lighting company, and he was also really rena renowned for bringing young people in. So like he would take on students and people who were straight out of university and put them on a small tour and kind of mentor them and guide them. Oh, nice. And he, I, I got to know him just through via via, via through a couple of different friends and. 
actually, I remember um, the first time I met him, I had a false start, actually. Uh, the first time I met him, I would have been probably 20 at a push. I hadn't got a clue what I was doing, like really, really just new into lighting. And I think my, my ex-boyfriend was working on a tour where he'd done the lights and he'd said, oh, my, my girlfriend really wants to tour and she can run a pearl. Would you be interested? And Brian said, yes, yes, I'm desperately short of pearl operators. Give her my number and send her to me. So anyway, I end up being put in touch with this person who I see as this, you know, and he, and he was you know, this really, really um, experienced lighting designer. So I sent him a message. He said, oh, I'm, I'm doing a show in Cardiff. So come on up to Cardiff at the university. And uh, I think it's it Goldfrapp. That was it. It was Goldfrapp at the university in Cardiff. And come on and I'll meet you there and we'll have a chat. And I was like, I just had no idea what to expect. So I remember like printing out my CV, which was probably half an A4 paper at that point, <laughs> like a photo of the only show I'd ever done lights for. <laughs> just making my the way Christmas up. Christmas party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just making my way up to Cardiff. And um, it's probably, yeah, like, you know, three trust tour, sort of 1200 capacity venue. Beautiful show, but simple. And I remember just being like, oh my God, this is... This is incredible. And they've got black truss. Never seen black truss before. <laughs> oh, it's really professional. And I had dinner with him and had a chat with him. And I was clearly way too inexperienced to get any work. And he sent me on my way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really politely, like, I'll be in touch. You know, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> and I never heard from him again for two or three years. And I was like, oh, yeah. You know, when you look back in hindsight and you yeah. think, oh, yeah, I've probably made a bit of a fool of myself there. And then a couple of years later, I was working at Glastonbury and, and, and we met again. And by that point... I've got a bit more experience, I guess. And he, he was the one that said, right, I've got a job for you. Come with me. And again, we had a couple of full starts. He, he set me up to do a couple of tours, which just didn't happen, got cancelled or postponed. And eventually he got me on um, a tour with Turing Breaks, a small, small club tour in the UK. I had, I think, five lights and a, a, and a, a pearl and just a trailer tour around. And, and that was a turning point. It was like as soon as I'd done one tour and proven that, you know, the band hadn't, asked for me to be taken off the bus after 10 days, you know, yeah. made it to yeah, the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was it. It was like, okay, cool. We've got another one and another one. I literally didn't look back, but it, it's like you say, it's that kind of, it's that first step's really hard to get that break. And at the time you feel like it's never going to come. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Uh, <laughs> I have to think back actually. What, you're on your first tour or your... Or... No, not my first tour, but my first gigs. Um, yeah, I think I started I started in school when I was in high school. I was like, um, I did the music and the microphones for the speech of uh, of the principal and stuff like that. And I didn't know absolutely not what, what I was doing. So I learned how, what a fader did and how I could connect it and... It all took off from there, I think. Hey, for for me, for working for bands, I I uh, I am still a friend of a, a, a very good sound engineer, Ruud van Klarenbergen. And I was I don't know why, but he had at that I was still young. I was twenty one, and but at a very early point, he I was his I did his replacements. So uh, and then uh, yeah, I got from there. Oh, sorry, from uh, from one gig to another. So, it, but you 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 just have to have. Sometimes it's really in these little details, eh? Like meeting someone meeting somewhere, someone yeah. somewhere, and then of course get that one chance that yeah. yeah yeah, and that and then of course you have to do yeah a proper job, a good mix. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course. But yeah, it's something that you can't, yeah, you can study and you can be, yeah, you can prepare yourself, but it's not like, yeah, that you have to put in a resume or something no, like. No, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah because uh, you say then you got your first touring gig, was that an operating job or or yeah. that was no design or almost no design yet? No, I mean, th there was no design really. Um, and I think I can comfortably say this. I, I remember calling Brian from the first show because there was no lighting plot or anything like that. You know, it was no pre-production. It was just, there's going to be some lights on a trailer and you need to do lights for this band. And I remember opening the trailer and being like, Brian, um, what do you want me to do? And he was quite blunt. I think he was on a much bigger show. He was like, 
whatever's in there, just do whatever you think looks okay. Make it work. <laughs> but you had the lights with you on the tour. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, okay. like five lights. Yeah. And there was no rigging in any of these venues. So it was just like, okay, I've got... But what, what capacity capacity venues are we Probably talking about? Probably around 800, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. small kind of... Academy, uh, the, how does it, yeah. Yeah, sort of academy and university circuit, yeah. but the, the smaller end of. Yeah. And yeah, it was like, just make something happen with it. So yeah, it was... Did you like that uh, that level of touring, or was it quickly for you that uh, I'm not? Um, I don't know. I've got really good memories, and I really enjoyed the sort of creativity with it. In a sense, you know, you don't have sometimes you, you know you're you've got quite limited resources, so you have to find ways to get the most out of what you've got. Mm -hmm. And I quite enjoy that. And I think in 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 those periods you get to know oh you do with every tour don't you yeah you just you just get to know what what might work with certain songs in that band and just even if it's just 12 floor cans you can do a lot with that and I, I think some of the the best shows are actually really simple and some of the most um inspiring work you see is sometimes when people don't actually have a huge budget to play with or a lot and they they really think creatively with what they've got and there's I, I, more in it. yeah And I, I think it's really important when you're you're learning as well to to go through that and to not have it all on a plate, to, to not you know walk into your first tour where you've got the same rig every day and you've got mm -hmm. everything you could possibly need to make a show. You need to learn how to make a show with not enough actually, and 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 what you can get away with skipping and what is a necessity, and 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 from there build up. I think that's so. That level really made you a, a better. Uh... I think uh, so. I think it's where I learned the trade. I, I don't think, you know, that's that's where you. Also, you can experiment more. I mean, there's less at stake, and I don't. I don't mean that it's less important, but I mean <laughs> expectations are a lot lower. Yeah. You've got 12 lights. <clears throat> oh yeah, the, the guitarist was a bit dark tonight. Yeah, sorry, I've only got 12 lights. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not a sackable offence. It's and and. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't have enough lights physically to light all the musicians on stage. How can I play around with this to see what I, you know, and you, you do learn tricks that then I think serve you well when you're dealing with much bigger budgets and, and you know, you. Yeah. 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 I, 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 that's the, the level of, if, if you're able to work for a band that, that plays like a thousand to 2000 capacity venues a couple of times a week, That's already already a decent level of, allez, you know what I mean, eh? It's it's the starting point of of, but yeah, if we're talking about tour buses at that level or and a trailer with some equipment, it's yeah, mm -hmm. it's already a big step up compared to the pub. Uh, yeah, the and pub, I think that's uh, that's where it comes back to what you're saying about as lighting people, we probably tend to enter. At, in in terms yeah. of a band's career trajectory, we kind of enter at a later points. So our bottom line for experience is probably already a a bigger gig in terms of you know they've already done would, would, would yeah. you would you oh sorry Peter. no no go ahead yeah i i i <laughs> i was saying sorry uh, no we start we start we start in the pub as a sound engineer already but that's not a point that you because in the pub you don't have any lighting like or two, lighting console or two uh, sound to light led power cans i mean uh, what can uh, you? would you would you if if uh, if they call you for a tour like that today Would you do it? Or is that... And they pay you, eh? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Would you, would you still like to do it? Or uh, are you like, oh, no, that's not the thing that I... Uh... Uh, there's, uh, yeah, so I don't have a straight answer to that, which probably says a lot. Um, yes, in sense, the shows, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy doing it. And I happily do a show of any size, you know, if um, you're available to do it and the money's right... Yeah, it's, it doesn't have to be a, a big show with a big budget. Would I go back to doing academy touring out of choice? Um, by the time I stopped doing it, I wasn't enjoying it anymore. So that would be why I'd say no. Um, yeah. it, it just, I had a brilliant time throughout my 20s. And at the end of that period, I think I was ready for a new challenge. Yeah. Like, you know, and also... Venues on the circuit here are a lot better than in the UK. You know, when when you look at equipment, installation, yeah. 
<laughs> it, it's a huge difference and that makes a big difference because if you said to me now okay would you mind going you know would you like to go and do this tour and I was going through like the AB and Hit Depot and Paradiso so, yeah of course like of course I would yeah, yeah. brilliant yeah. let's do it but <clears throat> typically a lot of venues on the same sized capacity circuit in the UK they just don't have that level of investment no. so the kit's not there or broken or there isn't that passion perhaps in some places there are some venues which are brilliant don't get me wrong you know we've all been to of them course, yeah. but it, it can be a slightly more soul destroying experience when you're like six weeks in and you're you know you've got somebody who's just not not interested really and none of the kit works you're like oh my god yeah but you have the kit side the equipment side but also yeah you can end up in england like in a venue for a thousand capacity venue with just one dressing room eh? mm-hmm which makes it really hard to to spend your day with yeah, yeah. with 12 people or something. When, you, when you've been on that bus yeah. and then yeah. you're... And I think it's a real shame. It's a real shame because it's a, it's a you know, one of the, the best things I think about British culture is is the rich history we've got with music and live mm-hmm. music and, and festivals. And I think it's, it's a pity that there isn't sometimes the investment or the drive to, you know... There's a big duality uh, is that a word in english yeah. yeah there's a big duality in live music i think in uh, in england because it's like so important hey, it's really like the heart almost of in, in my from my perspective point of view yeah from like uh, uh from f- cultural uh, scene but then on the other hand like the infrastructure of some venues or the way they treat my well, treat it's too negative but yeah Compared to your uh, European festivals, yeah, it can be can be quite it can be hard. grim. Yeah, it can be grim, grim and hardcore. Uh, and, and there are some which are brilliant, absolutely yeah. brilliant, you know, and incredibly well resourced. Or even sometimes it's not about the resources or the finances. It's just about having a a passionate team of people who want to make a great show. That's that's what you're all there for. Um, I think it's really, yeah, it's a pity that when it's such an enormous part of the culture, there there are some festivals and there are some venues that just don't get the investment mm-hmm. or the the yeah, but also festivals. Eh? I ended up with a um, uh, you you know I worked for a for a, the drum and bass band uh, Netsky. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, drum and bass was was and is. Yeah, very big in, in the UK. So we spend a lot of uh, uh, time on the on your island. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, um, and we also had a very nice English tour manager, Mike Clegg. Love, oh, I yeah. worked with you know? Mike. Yeah? Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. Love him. Yeah, love him. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, I would love to see him um, again. Uh, but yeah, we, we sometimes we were kind of high on the bill, uh, not like uh, just before the headline or something, and. We didn't even have artist catering. They gave us like yeah, five pounds to get a, a hamburger on on the side. I'm like, and to pay for uh, the coffee yeah, backstage. But, yeah, it's <laughs> like what? Whoa, what the fuck is this? Hey, I'm not talking about a, a thousand uh-huh. capacity festivals. Eh? Like proper festivals. Yeah, we're like, whoa, what's going on here? Why do you think the 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 difference is so big? Is is it a financial issue or is it just culture and knowing nothing else or? I think it's a bit double. Um, And to go back a bit here, I think, you know, you're probably aware of this anyway, but, you know, from our point of view, coming from British touring crew, like we regard the festivals here as being the best, you know. The first time you come and do a rock work or a pukle pup or a pink pop, you're just like, oh my God, oh, oh, this is... This is how it's done. You know, yeah. first show at the AB, <laughs> you know, bearing in mind you've done the Academy circuit, you know, yeah. eight times, and then you turn up at the AB, which is on the same ter- circuit on the European leg, and you're like, we've got catering and a choice of lighting rig and dressing rooms. You know, it's, 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 yeah. they're just worlds <laughs> apart. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think. But there's a, I, we're quite involved with Glastonbury Festival for one of the stages, for instance, and I've been working there since... Well, you know, I started as a volunteer before I started doing, you know, a, a job in production and, and have worked there uh, on the John Peel stage since I was, you know, 18. Um, and we have less, uh, considerably less funding. So the, the there are m- many more limitations to deal with backstage. And, you know, it's a festival that 
you know, okay, it's it's hugely successful, but they want to, you know, make money for charity as well. And it's 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 a it's a different entity completely to to a rock quarter. And we get that. They are two separate models. But I think what happens and, and trying to look at this from when when I've got my festival production hat on versus the touring hat, is those of us who've toured in Europe come back to our production meetings for British festivals and say, yes, but it's so much better here because of X, Y, and Z. But if the people who are organizing haven't experienced that perhaps, um, or they haven't seen the difference, they might not see where the value, they don't really, I get the feeling they don't always understand why that's necessary. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, or why, yeah. do you, why do you need three meals a day in catering? You're at a festival. Just have a beer. It's fine. You know, well, <laughs> what, why do you need hot shower? Like, I, I mean, this yeah. is a bad example. Why do you need a shower? Have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bad example. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. No, no, but I, I get the point. I, yeah. uh, not, and this is not about Glastonbury, but about other conversations I've had with, with other projects where it's like, these things are really important if you've been on the road and this is your third gig of the weekend. And if these people don't tour and what they do is they organise festivals all year round, they don't necessarily see what we consider to be a priority. Mm -hmm. And that, I think fundamentally, that's where some of the problems come in. Yeah, I think as England is like the heart of the music scene where it all starts and happens still today, yeah, they don't need to do it. They don't they don't have have to give the luxury of everything like for for Werther, i know for rock Werther, that it's a sales point like they want to do everything so perfectly eh, and to get it on the high level that all the bands are like yeah but we really want to do Werther. it's more like a selling point and uh, and but yeah at glastonbury why should they you you, under, you, you know what i'm trying to yeah, say Kate, yeah. or am i clear or uh? yeah i think also for like european uh, bands is way difficult or of way more difficult <laughs> to get into the UK music scene than the other way around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of and course. Maybe that's also. But when it when it rains, th it. there's an expression: when it rains in England, yeah. it drops in the rest of the world. Eh? No, uh, and no. music scene. Eh? Hey, a good a good review in the NME. Eh? Yeah, it's a ticket uh, to to go and play all all uh, all over the uh, all over the the world. Eh? Still today. It's interesting, isn't it? How much of a difference it... It's something I think is really positive in the last few years is I've noticed um, there's a lot more uh, European artists um, getting a lot more kind of um, primetime play on Radio 1 um, and, and, and much more prevalent, I would say, yeah. than, than 10 years ago. And it does... Like um, Christine and the Queens, um, Sigrid, um, Sarah Larson. It, it's... I think it's a good, it's not enough, but it's a, it's a good positive step forward that I remember I was driving back from a festival last year um, in, in the UK and I was listening, it was the same weekend as Radio 1, big weekend, and they were interviewing the artists backstage and I noticed there was a significantly um, higher presence of European artists performing at Radio 1, big weekend than I remember uh, 10 years earlier or five years earlier. And I think that's a step in the right direction. I, I still feel a bit sad that in order for... Christine and the Queen's single to do really well in the UK. It had to be translated and re-released in English. I'm like, really? Did they do that? Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know either. Yeah, yeah. it's like, well, can't we just appreciate it in French? I mean, these are our neighbours. Come on, guys. Yeah, we, yeah. You know, uh, uh, yeah, that's a bit. Hey, I just want to po uh, also point out that uh, po point out that uh, maybe I was. Uh, I'm, I'm, I wasn't negative eh, about these uh, venues, mm. uh, but I wasn't also so very positive, but. For me, in my top 10 of most crazy uh, gigs, yeah, there's a, uh, a couple of gigs in, in, the, in, uh, on the, in England. Eh? Mm. Crazy audiences. Which eh? ones? Some... Which are your favorites? Oh, I, to be honest, I can't really uh, uh, remember uh, them all. But That's like, why they're so eh? uh, <laughs> no, crazy. But, but, but yeah, like uh, for, 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 yeah. Then as we, we were talking about Netsky, yeah, we did some crazy like in Newcastle I remember yeah, the, like the audiences are amazing audiences, like, it's like the, the north of England especially and Scotland Northern Ireland it's mm. absolutely incredible I, I I remember being in Newcastle I, I think outside it was minus 
20 or something. Hey, and these young people, they came in in the venue in their top t-shirt girls, uh, just like, like, like they were on, on Ibiza, yeah. like ready to party. But like, I was almost scared, like, oh shit, already plastic on the, on the console. And yeah, the first song it hit, <laughs> it hit, it hits off, but like, it's like your, yeah, like you have to hold on your, everything is moving. It's so, so loud. Yeah, yeah. Sound limitations in the UK. It's not so strict, let's say, but like some so high energy audiences. I, I really, really loved it. And but not only with Net, uh, not only with Netsky, with, with a couple of artists that I, that I was there, like, yeah, it's, you feel, you, you really feel the. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's also a big difference with uh, uh, the crowds here, especially in Belgium then I think, or, no, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, or just different. Not not better or worse. Maybe but it depends on the music or the the genres, like the drum and bass scene. It's really specific, maybe, and it's a party vibe when you compare it to a more like pop artist. I think I it, like, definitely when you're touring in the UK, like the you see the difference geographically in different parts of the country and how people enjoy mm. music. And the north of England, let's say north of England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Ireland generally, um, people really get into it. it, it the atmosphere is incredible. And also the feeling that you, everybody's bought their ticket to go and see a show. You know, they are up for coming out to have a great night. Yeah. Whereas sometimes the further south you go, there's people are a bit more sort of, um, okay, we're just going to, you know, see how we feel about this, you know. Okay, entertain me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This is the fifth gig I've seen it's this week. beautiful music. <laughs> it's, it's quite, it's quite good. Music. Yeah, it's quite good. <laughs> yeah. And you just think, come on, guys, get into it. Get out there. Have a good time. Um but no, like, like, and it's interesting. I've not really thought about it in that much detail, but Brixton Academy, iconic venue, like so many fantastic shows there. Mm -hmm. Again, Hammersmith Apollo is a brilliant venue. It, it does feel once you get up to the bigger venues, the venues where you'd be bringing your own production in as well, um, that problem's not there anymore. They're great venues. They're uh, great atmosphere. For, they're really for, for, for historic. Me, that's, that's the level of, I've never toured uh, I hope I can do it one day, but I've never toured with an artist who, who's who, who's who's playing in these kind of uh, venues, in like the, UK, the Apollo uh, or. Uh, it's it's a, and it's a complete switch as soon as you are in that and you, you're you're carrying your own production. Um, the the whole experience is uh, on another level. Really, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's yeah. great. It's absolutely brilliant. And yes, yeah. you know, do you, is that is that your favourite uh, level? Of Probably touring? actually, yeah. yeah. That's what we I would have been. Um, well, we would have been doing a tour at that kind of level with Elbow when this kicked off. So we they were starting in. It was interesting starting in Zigadome, Force National, um, uh, Arena in Dublin, and then UK was going to be four weeks of theatres, like large theatres. Yeah. And actually, that's brilliant. It's just big enough that you can be really creative with the design but small enough that there's a fantastic atmosphere at every show you're not you're not you mean in the in the crew and with with the band or both or, you know uh, you're in a theater not an arena and i think that makes a big difference mm -hmm. how did you make the switch from like operating and doing the smaller tours to being the designer and the next level bands and venues did it go organically? It was quite organic, yeah. yeah. She so, had a couple of beers with uh, Brian, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah How does anything go? <laughs> yeah, I think the whole, th yeah, the, the whole, whole experience has been kind of quite gradual. Um, started off operating for someone else's designs. And then, you know, I was really lucky, I suppose, Elbow were the first, they're my longest standing client and the first artist I sort of worked with at the beginning of my career who you know the first tour we did we did um small academies and university venues sort of 800 capacity and a year later we were doing Wembley Arena so I, uh, I started working with them just as seldom seeing kid came out did Elbow did Wembley Arena mm, not the stadium the arena oh, yeah yeah the arena yeah okay yeah yeah sorry and um, so it, it was that kind of it, it was the second second tour I went out on and I was still very, very new to touring and, and Brian had designed the show and it was me and two technicians and they'd, they'd had a four-year hiatus. Um, I think it was a four-year hiatus anyway. 
went on the road with them. Uh, we did a festival season and that, that album just did so well um, that we, the tours got bigger and longer and the venues got bigger. And yeah, we ended up in arenas at the end of that. And then that sort of launched them into touring arenas from there on. And that was kind of how it, how it was quite organic, you know, starting as an operator. And then as the shows got bigger, becoming more involved in working together with Brian to do the designs until the first time we did an arena show. And I remember being absolutely terrified and saying, oh, you know, mm. what, what do we... And so you called Brian again. Uh. Like, Brian. So I just put it on. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, well, where, where do I begin? Yeah. It's an arena. He's like, well, I think we had a coffee and he was like, you start in the same place as you do in a theatre. You just add more lights. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> good. And uh, the next step in that journey, that was then founding... Right, uh, right. Hey, wait, 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 one second. I, I, sorry, <laughs> sorry. My, we have all the time. No, I just wanted, at that point, I just want to know no, no, a, 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 a small uh, sub question. Elbow, what, they were already like going on for ages, right? Yeah. At, that, at that point? Yeah. I, I sh Five or six albums so already? So, Sardom Seen Kid was their fourth album. Make sure I get that right. Yes, that was their fourth studio album. So they'd, they'd released... I remember when I was at college, first thinking about mixing desks, um, the first album was out and on the radio a lot. Um, so when yeah, when I got the phone call to do it, I was like, oh my goodness, I remember listening to them at college. <laughs> um, and yeah, they, they I don't know the intricacies of, of the story well enough to to repeat it, but they'd, they'd released three albums and then they, they took a break um, and changed label. And then they came back with Seldom Seen Kid. And now we are on eight, I think. Eight, eighth album. Yes. Oh, okay. One of my best uh, Rock Werchter memories is Elbow, I think. The bass player just uh, got a kid or... Uh, I remember they were toasting on stage. It was uh, on the main stage, uh, sundown, really great. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. 2013, 14, yeah. something like that. Yeah, that would have been. Oh, God, I'm trying to think. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a mind blank. Build a Rocket Boys. So I reckon that yeah. would have been around 2011 or could have been 2014. I don't know, I'd have to ask him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, call, yeah. Call, yeah. Call <laughs> around then. <laughs> Gary, okay. what's his name again from this, uh, the main guy? Guy. Guy. Yeah. 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 Guy. Guy. <laughs> the main guy. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I uh, I interrupted you, uh, Peter. Oh, Sorry. No, no, no worries, no worries. So the next step in that was then um, founding Bright Design. What what was the idea behind that? Because <laughs> I find the idea because that? I find a really nice quote on your website. A quote from Aristotle that I thought was nice, and the quote was. Uh, their whole is greater than the sum of their parts. Was that actually the idea? Because I, I didn't write that quote. Just to just to be clear, no. Um, what? Why, where did Bright come about? So um, sorry if I'm waffling on with the long, far too detailed answers here. No, not at all. Um, Anyone need anything to drink? Well, <laughs> since you mentioned it, no. Bram is also the bartender here. Ah. Someone you gotta do it. So. <laughs> Important. Uh, where did we go from? Yeah, so there was there was started started with Elbow and worked for a few other artists, um, and I kind of ended up um, moving from programming and being a lighting director into designing the tours I was working on. Um, and one of my business partners, Pablo, we've been friends um, since uh, I think since I was since I first left school. He worked for the same company that I started out with, the Bristol company. Yeah, oh, nice. um, and Pablo's a video, um, his background's video, he's a projectionist, um, and he makes video content. So when I started designing shows, um, we were incorporating video in a lot of the designs, and then you need content. And um, at that point, certainly in kind of club and theatre tours, people were including video more and more, but I was finding that we were people were relying on stock content. You know, it, it was, okay, we need video because that's the thing. Um, but there wasn't really a lot of thought, okay, w what are we going to do about, you know, content? There certainly wasn't a budget for it. Um, so um, Pablo started making, you know, content for, for some of the, the tours and stuff. It started off with just doing simple, you know, simple things that were just a bit more kind of tailored to what the artist wanted rather than what was available. 
Um, and that sort of, that kind of grew organically. Um, again, just uh, working together on lots of projects and eventually, um, oh, sorry, I'm really going off track here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, we, we were working a lot with um, Mike, who's my other business partner, and he... Uh, initially was like programming a lot of shows with us and doing a lot of the kind of CAD and, and, and drawing work. And at a certain point we said, well, it kind of makes sense if we, if, if Mike joined um, Pablo and I, and I was finding at that time that when I was um, working for, you know, one artist and going on tour, obviously the, the, the campaign might last sort of six, 10 months, but then another client would be getting ready to go on tour. So you were kind of trying to design a show whilst, still on tour and it was becoming harder and harder to manage um, multiple clients and multiple tours whilst working independently. Um, so really kind of the initial idea of Bright was quite organic again. It was sort of like, okay, well, we're working together as freelancers all the time. Let's make this more official. Um, let's support each other and kind of put our, our different skill sets together and be able to facilitate designing shows more effectively yeah, and also more like having a, a backup and a back office kind of yeah, vibe 100%. Because, yeah if you're touring constantly and designing constantly uh, it must be a hectic period yeah absolutely i remember particularly around that time we we had um an arena tour going out with elbow and i was on tour with ellie goulding and like her campaign would have finished but her second album did really well. So then they decided, okay, we're going to do a short arena tour at the end of it. But that arena tour literally took us to two days before production rehearsals were starting with Elbow. And on the one hand, you know, people were joking, so it's a bit greedy, isn't it? And it, it's like, well, it's it's not really about wanting to do everything. It's just the fact that we've been doing this show for two years and I want to see it to the end. And I'm really excited and I'm really happy that the artist I'm working with has made that transition. And I, I want to be part of that story and, of and, and close the project. But also this other client's really important to me and I, I really want to be involved in that. And I, choice is difficult, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and having the company was immediately that way of going, okay, cool, well, we can facilitate multiple projects and you can be out doing one tour whilst planning another tour. And also Mike and Pablo had their own clients, but, you know, Mike um, was doing already at that time a lot of stuff for Vivo, a lot more kind of multi-camera broadcast projects rather than touring. Pablo does a lot of content production. So it was a nice way to kind of bring all those things together and um, each of us have sort of subtly different skill sets and strengths. So, But um, Pablo and Mike, they don't operate. They do, yeah. Ah, so they also, they also Pablo, operate. Um, Pablo's from video background, um, so he doesn't operate lights, um, but, you know, he can, he can operate a media server, um, but predominantly his work is animating and video editing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more studio based. Um, and Mike has a similar background to me. He um, he started in theatre and came through. He's toured as well. Um, and he's, he's a, a, a programmer and an operator and a but lighting designer. On, on, the, on the practical side, uh, having a company and having it in name, it was like more official, like, yeah, I'm now uh, uh, the designer and it gave you the opportunity to put other operators on a tour. Yes. Yeah. Having Bright was like the key to being able to, to put operators. Yes. On the, uh, yeah, is that, is, yeah. yeah, kind of. Like, I think the, the main reason for starting it was very much the, um, how can I facilitate or how can we facilitate all of the clients that we like working for and do a good job without having to say, well, sorry, I'm on tour with this guy. So I can't, you know, I can't do your project. Um, it wasn't really intended in the in the offset to be the end of touring for me. It was more yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. great. Let's let's you know let's let's broaden our horizons and and offer more services, I guess. Um, but then obviously over time, as as that expanded and built, it became more apparent that being on tour and running a company was a challenge. To be honest with you, it was the 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 crunch point for me as I went and did the Ellie Goulding tour in 2016, and that was the first time. I'd done an uh, arena tour that had gone worldwide. So we were out for 10 months and that was the summer where we decided, okay, this, I can't do this anymore because being in the wrong time zone in the U S for three months whilst trying to run a company in the UK That's with, not other, you're, you're not, and actually I had a really good chat with our tour manager and she, she was the one who said to me, you know, you're not doing yourself any favors here because you're, you, your brain, you, your head's not really in either, you know, you're, mm -hmm. Your head is not what? Your head's not fully in either thing. You know, if you're if you're on the tour and you're just doing that tour, 
um, you're enjoying the days off, you're um, enjoying the, the, the routine and the rhythm of being on the road and, and the camaraderie. But if you're doing the tour and you're worrying about those shows, but every bit of downtime you've got is spent on the bus on your laptop trying to manage business back home, yeah you're suddenly missing out on the fun aspects of being mm -hmm. away yeah, discovering yeah, 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 yeah. a different country. Mm -hmm. um, and you get the feeling all the time that your clients back home are a bit frustrated because you're always answering emails in the wrong time zone or you're never quite available to jump on a call when they want you on a call. And, and you know, it wasn't a specific event as such. It just, you start to feel, I started to feel that I wasn't giving either thing 100%. Yeah. You know, I wasn't getting the enjoyment out mm -hmm. of touring anymore. And my design work was suffering because I was on tour. So it was a bit like, well, this just isn't sustainable long term. So at the end of that campaign in 2016, I said, right, that's it. I'm not going to go and do full touring campaigns anymore. I want to put my effort into designing because that's what I love. Hey, Kate, I have two questions. Yeah. <laughs> we keep on the bathroom. <laughs> The bartender is leaving. <laughs> only, no. only two questions. <laughs> no, 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 no. All that, but I, 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 do you like touring? Mm. Are you a touring uh, person? Yeah, I love it. Yeah? I love it. Okay. Mm, absolutely love it. And uh, you're talking about bri uh, bright design yeah. and saying less touring, more design, more like running the company. Did your clients uh, smoothly ac accept this? Uh, yes and no. Some people have been brilliant and understood the decision completely and backed it, and some haven't. Um, and as as a result, you know, over the over the years, there are projects I'm no longer involved with because it, it didn't work um, for that client to have a designer who wasn't on the road. And I think you know, as you make decisions in life and decisions with your career, that's that's the thing you end up weighing up. I found it difficult to have that conversation with people. I found it difficult to say, you know, I've been your touring LD for, I don't know, however many years or however long. Um, and I I want to design for you, but I don't want to go on be tour with, the you. Road with you anymore. <laughs> and I, I always had the feeling that that would be perceived as, well, I think I'm above that. And that's absolutely never been what it's about. It's been about the fact that I love designing, creating and building shows more than anything. You know, that initial conversation with an artist about a concept, like figuring it out, putting it through rehearsals, fine tuning it on the first couple of weeks of a tour and getting it just right for your big home city show or your big London or New York or whatever. And then once that show is polished and you're just responsible for maintaining it and making sure that it's delivered correctly every night, it's fun, but I would rather them be working on the next project and, and if and that makes sense. How, how, how do you do it now? So you design a show, you operate the first leg or the rehearsals or not even anymore? Uh, no, uh, uh, generally uh, work with programmers and operators who'll go on the tour. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do the design, um, we'll go into production rehearsals. Um, well, before we go into production rehearsals, we'll be in the studio um, with... Uh, the programmer um, and working through, especially with arena tours, it's not just about the lighting. You've got video, sometimes lasers. Um, so you, you you could be working with multiple programmers and trying to really um, make sure that everybody's, you, you're looking at the, the visual, um, the visual composition of the show as a whole. So, you know, okay, this song's yeah, more it's about... Not, you're, it's not focused on lights no, only anymore, not. your job. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, been, been the biggest change compared to 12 years ago when I started out as a lighting operator and it was some set and some lights or a backdrop. Yeah, yeah. And now it's, okay, how do, you, how do you get visual dynamic in the show? How do you have special moments? What happens here and where? And when do we bring in the automation? And actually scripting those elements and creating the, the show script or the visual script, as we, we call it, is a big part of the design process and then taking that into previs with your programmers and your operators, making sure everybody understands and, and experimenting as a team. Like, okay, cool, this, this song is going to be about this big moment with the lasers, for instance, or this cool thing that's happening with the visuals. What, what works with that? You know, this is what I've got in mind. What have you, right, okay. And it becomes a very collaborative process and I love that. I absolutely adore that kind of, you're, you're with a team of people who are all really specialised in what they do and everybody's getting the best out of their no. their bit. And are you... Go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, no, no. So, ask, ask, ask a question first because otherwise. Uh, are you uh, operator wise? Or are you still at the level that you could operate the show, but you're just not doing it because you're uh, the designer? Or uh, I'm out of practice. Yeah. Like, like this year, you mean yeah, a lot of people? Really? Don't worry, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> really? Um, no, no. But I mean, could you? Like, if we're talking about uh, a really like big, big production, would you be, or are you still? I wouldn't. I wouldn't no? do it myself now. No? no, because on on the project that we 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 did together, like uh, Oscar uh, yeah. and the Wolf, eh? yeah, uh, you always did the, yeah. the operating yourself. Eh? I did. Yeah, absolutely. And then the last um, the last campaign we did, Tim programmed it, and it's I think been a really interesting part of the transition of running a business and moving more into design is you start to realise your strengths and weaknesses. And I work with some amazing programmers and I've always loved programming, but I've never been super technical. And suddenly you look at the people you're working with and what they can get out of the equipment you're using in the rig and you realise, actually, you know, it, the sum of all parts, it really is that, you know, if you've yeah. got a fantastic lighting programmer and a fantastic video programmer, and a, you know, a great person ca cutting cameras, that makes the show. And if you can pull all those things together and make sure that it's all coherent and cohesive, you have a show that is a hundred times better than if you're trying to program the lights yourself and then do the server on the side. And then, yeah. and of course, when you're doing a club tour, you have to do that because there isn't the budget to have a lighting guy in a video, you know, or, or the need, but with the shows we did with Oscar, for instance, you know, they were really ambitious shows to pull together um, and hugely enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I agree. Sounded great. Good to hear. No, but, but yeah. um, I, it must be for, is it, oh, I'm going to ask a question instead. Isn't it very hard to make that decision? Like now in the transition that you are like, okay, I'm going to stop operating. Yeah, and, really? And I'm, uh, yeah. It's something that you really love doing. Yeah. Like, and you're also good at it. Maybe you're not like the fastest on it, on programming, maybe, but yeah, who, who cares actually? Eh? But like, so, it's but, like, uh, it's, it's like the same uh, jumping uh, to the beginning of the conversation, like saying, Van, yeah, my sound, maybe I have to leave it. Like like you said, maybe I should do lights. Uh, I, I enjoy uh, uh, flashing the lights. Like now, uh, like, yeah, thinking about or, or having to make a, a decision for the show, uh, because of course it's better for the show that you don't operate. Not, not that, that you're not good at it, but I mean, yeah, if if I would be like a stadium act, I wouldn't like my I I, I wouldn't want my my designer uh, to be on on one thing. Yeah, it's it it needs to have a full focus. Yeah, eh? and and actually, the first couple of um, bigger shows that I shouldn't have been operating, but I still was. It was a real steep learning curve of like, oh my god, I can't deal with this mm -hmm. because I need to finish programming. And it, it's horrendous. You're just like, I can see there's a problem over there. And actually I should be on stage speaking to the band about the fact that they're not happy with, for instance, this piece of scenic that's that's being delivered. But I can't because I've got to get this last song in before sound check. Yeah. 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 Also the things we, we did to get, we did to get were, as they were very ambitious, yeah. maybe like limit, like. <laughs> we, we pushed the boundaries of what was possible with the resources we had. I, yeah. Also. Yeah. You know, yeah, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was exciting and exhausting but incredibly rewarding like yeah. you get to the end of it and you're like oh my god i've not slept for days but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that was that was a good experience um but uh yeah. kate uh so you, you you took that decision yeah. like if it's necessary i'm not gonna operate i'm gonna yeah. put all my focus yeah and, on, and uh, short short answer to your question that last summer um there were a couple of festivals we did together where i thought oh is this the right decision because i still love you know i love that mm. Oh, yeah. Let's go. But I think you just get to a point where I've, I reached a point where it was like, okay, I can't fulfill my design contracts if I'm in the studio for two days prepping a festival show and then on the road for three days. When, when do you do the other work? In the evenings and in the weekends and on the oh, plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but yeah. Now talking like... Uh, 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 small view tunnel uh, vision uh, tunnel vision or, or uh, yeah mm. not not a, the big dream yeah it's 
at, at, at the end of the day, if, you, yeah, if you're an operator, you can work for the whole world, uh, matter of speaking. But if you're not operating anymore and you're like just a designer, yeah, your client perspective, it gets also uh, smaller and smaller. I, 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 yeah. It, 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 does yeah. that stress you out a little bit or how? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Was, you're that, not... is, was that a, a very strange question? No, <laughs> no, no I understood. I, I, I understood. <laughs> understood, yeah, because you build a relationship with your client when you're on the, the road with them and on the bus with them and, and backstage. And mm. it becomes harder to have that connection when you only see people in rehearsals. And um, and is, is there a proper, in your position, a proper market for it? Is, is, like, is yes. it like the, the step that you have to do? Like if we want to grow, that's, that's the thing I, I need to do? Yeah, absolutely. Huh? And it's much, much more commonplace. Um, I think in the, in, we see it more in the last sort of five to 10 years that um, certainly uh, once you sort of large theatre arena touring upwards, um, most designers won't go on the road or they, you know, they'll do rehearsals in the first few shows and then they'll move on to another project and lighting directors and programmers will take it out uh-huh. that's kind of expected but it, it becomes hard when you're you're making that transition yourself with an artist you know where they're used to having you there all the time Again. and suddenly you're Again. not yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> um maybe that's that's linked to this what i find interesting of i wonder how does a creative process like designing a show how does it start or is star always different or is it always the same who comes up with the ideas is it the collaboration i'd say it's different every time um but you develop a process that you know works for you so for instance some artists will or clients know what they want you know and they're very good at articulating that so they will come to you and they will say okay i've seen this and i've seen this and i like this and i want and then your job is to say, okay, how do I make that work within the parameters of the budget, you know, the venue and the, the other things. Other clients are less clear on what they want. They might know what they don't like, or they might have sort of quite like this, quite like that, you know, or, or, or a more left field reference. There was a sculptor from, you know, this era that I quite like. And and that's quite interesting because you then need to take those sort of threads and, and listen to the record and the narrative behind the record and try and create something that is suitable for that client or that artist that tells their story and accompanies their, their music. Um, I was, yeah, I, I, I find that, Probably the most interesting part of the process is the fact that you know that the artist you've been working for has been, you know, in the studio maybe for two years, mm-hmm. curating and perfecting this piece of work. So there's, I've always feel there's quite a responsibility with then taking that and interpreting that visually. And there is always that moment before you present the first design where you think, oh my God, what if they think like, this is horrible or... <laughs> or, 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 or they take it and they go, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where they go, um, that song's not about that. And you think, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> has it happened? No, but I do think about it. <laughs> not yet. I've had the I've had the odd the odd pause where you're like, uh oh, <laughs> you know. So this is uh, <laughs> this nice, is but uh, special, interesting, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting or bad? Interesting. No, yeah, I think I think it's led for the. I say different for every client, but then once you establish, you know, whether you're being presented quite a clear idea or whether you're really starting from a blank piece of paper, the process becomes quite similar. You find your own way of navigating from that first conversation to the design delivery. And, uh, maybe at this point, um, artists work with you for your style or. For how you do things, yeah. How, no. Why do artists work with you? What, no what's, idea. What's, yeah. No <laughs> idea. No, but what's what's your strength in 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 that thing? Let's say Bram, Pita, and I we have a band. <laughs> we do. Why should we work with you? <laughs> it's a great idea. Because I enjoy, <laughs> I enjoy a glass of wine backstage with you. <laughs> yeah, but you're not coming on tour with us. You don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> Jesus. Um, I didn't think this was a job interview, Christ. Um, no, I... Yeah, we're looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, what would I say? What 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 sets you... Uh, sets me... Uh, no, well, I... Hey, it, Nothing. It does, no, um, no, but what... what no, I, I like, it's, I suppose... Just... 
it shouldn't be hard to, uh, all right, or you shouldn't feel uh, embarrassed. It's not embarrassed, but yeah, if 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 it's something that you're really good at, it's yeah. I like storytelling, and I like to um, listen to what they're trying to say. I think that's the thing where I start with everything is like, okay, what what is the story? What is the narrative? What is the message? Could be any of those things. And how do we then present that visually in a way that works? Um, it's not just about having a big, flashy, impressive production. It's about trying to get under the skin of like, what is, what is the style um, or the story that this particular person or client or artist is is trying to say? And how can we do something that's completely original? Um, are you also going uh, more and more into like uh, show, sh not like light design, but also show design and yeah. like, yeah, maybe you should think about uh, dancers, maybe you should think about uh, costume changes. I don't know, eh? or thinking about, or not even changes, but uh, yeah, if like, for example, Elbow, yeah, like, yeah, if you want to do, tell this story, maybe visually, uh, lights and video, that's one thing, but can we also talk about uh, yeah y y the clothes on stage on uh, on on on, on uh, yeah decor who said that uh, yeah decor yeah uh, yeah you, you know is it, is yeah. that the whole package uh, more and more is that needed more and more do yes <laughs> do uh, yeah. yeah yes I think um, again in recent years people are more concerned with the overall look of the show the coherence the show design it's not just about doing lighting or putting a screen at the back of the stage with some artwork it's more about a concept why is that changing um i think two things obviously social media instagram youtube people come and watch your show it is online for the world to see so you want it to be um you want it to be impressive you want it to be appropriate as well you know you want whatever's happening around you visually you want that to be coherent and you want that to be right for your image it's it's not about a band playing with some lights flashing in time anymore it's about this is what this artist is about um so i think that the one hand it's the social media side of it that's that's pushed that the other thing is that income's now touring not record sales so you need to stand out you need to be unique you need to have your visual identity and in the last decade, I think that's, that's, you know, we've benefited as a sector. We've absolutely benefited because it's no longer just arena touring artists that want a production design. You know, people are saying, okay, we've got a trailer tour going out. We've got a uh, limited space, limited budget, but what can we do that sets us aside from every other band playing that festival stage? Mm -hmm. So I think that's forced more creativity. Um, and also with the technology, you know, everything's becoming more, um, um, so lighting and video are more, um, <laughs> can I just say this as a side note, yeah, <laughs> since I've been learning Dutch and not been home much, I keep looking for words in English and I can't find them anymore. <laughs> can you use it? We should, we should do the podcast in Dutch if you like, prefer. Hey, for us, Dutch is, is no problem. <laughs> really? Last 10 minutes. <laughs> nee, 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 yeah. Uh, um, yeah, there's more synchronicity between lighting and visuals and... Uh, you know, stage design than... The overall show, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. It all has to be really coherent. So... Yeah, I think show design's becoming more of a more of a I think the audience expects it also because it's becoming more and more trends and mm -hmm. all, all the big acts are doing it. So now they just expect it and if yeah. it isn't there, then yeah, it's, it's almost not like a some, good show. Yeah. It's almost like something's missing. Yeah. You know, yeah. something's not quite there. And then in answer to your question about um dancers and stuff, I think there's a there's a there's a fine line and it, it sometimes blurs between show design and production design. And creative direction. So, you know, doing a pop show, you would expect to have a creative director on board who might take care of the scripting. You know, what are the scenes, the acts, what is the story that the artist is trying to tell? Um, do we have dancers, costume, um, visuals, special effects? And, and then we become more about production design so that the creative director will do more of that scripting and we will do scenic design, lighting and video to support that. Mm -hmm. Um, with some of the bands. But if, if needed, are you a creative director also? Yeah, so for Elbow, for instance, the, there's no, we, we don't have a creative director because, mm -hmm. you know, we, it's not a show where we'd have dancers and choreography. Um, but in that, I might have conversations with the band about what they're wearing on stage, um, 
and then and then you take a more broad same with George Ezra we we didn't have a dedicated creative director so I did the show direction um yeah and, and worked out the kind of narrative through the show and how all the visuals sort of tied into that so that's a really a different job totally job different. Than, than, like do you, operating do you uh, like doing that I do love you, it do you think that's a good part that's no part of your job and it wasn't before I love it and that's that's part of why I've I've said okay this is the direction I'm going in because I've had an amazing time touring I've loved it and it's really hard to say okay I'm not going to do that I miss it and you, I miss that adrenaline and that mm -hmm. that energy you get off the crowd but in terms of a career and a job, it's the the working together and the collaborating with a team of people and building a show. And for me, that is absolutely what I'm passionate about. And if I need to make a decision and that is, okay, coming off the road to concentrate on show design, then, you know, that's that's what drove me really to to make that switch. Yeah. Yeah, very. I, I, I think that's very, very interesting. And, and, yeah. Absolutely. I think that's also pure creativity. Then you can give your whole heart in, in, into a design of something, not only yeah, in but, life, but, but, but giving it up, giving giving the aspect yeah. of like, yeah, it's a big, that, that's a big price Kate is have, have to pay to to be the show designer. <laughs> and, you're and to still be, to part be of the show. It's not yeah, like but, you set yeah, it apart yeah, for think, something else. Yeah. It takes... Uh, it takes uh, a lot of courage to, I think, to make a decision like that. Yeah, and I, I didn't make a clean break. It, it, I sort of edged that way over the course of three years, I would say, you know, where I would I would take on new clients and set those boundaries, but with old clients, I'd still go on the road. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's difficult. also hard because then you get to a point of going, hang on a minute, you're not touring with us, but you're touring with them. And it's like, you just... Yeah, but... Uh... <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, it's tricky. And, it, you know... I don't want to give up operating. No, you have to. Also, technology moves on. I'm now realizing that I've not done a lot of programming and operating for a few years. And when you look at the new software that's coming out, it's like you need to be doing it full time to stay on top of, of yeah, that. Yeah. So at some point, you've just got to choose and specialize, mm -hmm. I think. Otherwise, you end up being a bit average at everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, but, uh, do we have some time? Or yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay. We always have time. Uh, That's not true, but you're a woman in a man's world. <laughs> <laughs> really? How, how come there? There? How, how is it to be? No, I think the first oh, question yeah, 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 be totally. is why? Why are there so not so many women doing what we do in our in our branch? Is there a reason or is there, or what do you think? That's a very good question. You've got a lot of very good questions. Yeah, but we're very good. We're a very good podcast. Huh? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Even in English. Deep. Um, why aren't there as many women? I think uh, previously uh, this sector was less accessible for women. And that's certainly something I see when I talk to women older than me. Um, I feel fortunate to have had the opportunities I've had. And generally speaking, as I said earlier, I started young. Um, I didn't experience a lot of sexism. I have experienced some. I have had those moments where I have not won a job because we don't want a woman on the bus. You know, quote, unquote. Okay. We don't want a woman on the bus. Um, and with the benefit of hindsight, I can look back on those projects and think I'm happy that I didn't end up with them on a bus yeah. because if they say things like that something, yeah. something better came along uh, at the time it, it, it was you know shit should we know uh, the guy <laughs> <laughs> name and shame name and shame <laughs> well I didn't think we named and shamed here no no uh, no, no, no um yeah it, but maybe a, we can make an exception yeah there's a, a, a British artist called Jack Pignate some years ago and uh, that was don't like the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was going to be one of my first tours, but it was it was literally yeah no I, you know I can't I can't um, you know I can't swear and fart if there's a woman on the bus. It was like where do we even begin with this? Yeah. Really? Um, no, I think uh, when I speak to um, there's a few colleagues who were coming into lighting as women in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, and they have now moved into other roles within within the sector. 
when I speak to them about their experience of trying to cut it as as lighting technicians and lighting designers, I'm very grateful that I've had a much, much easier path. I've met far less resistance um, and generally had nothing but support, which is great. Um, we still don't have enough women coming into the sector. I agree with that. I don't think <laughs> I, I don't think it will ever be 50-50 and I'm not sure it needs to be, but I think it needs to be we need to we need a more diverse workforce. Yeah. Um, and I think that starts with accessibility. I think that starts with education and opportunities. You, you can't just say, okay, we've, we've got a, you know, and this is internationally, you know, we mm. have a, a workforce that is predominantly white men. Okay. It's a fact, yeah. Yeah. but you, you don't address that by going and taking people off the street and bringing them in and training them up. You address that by changing the way people think when they're in education and making people understand that these are jobs that are available and they can do it. Yeah. Do you feel there's it's getting better in those situations? Because a lot of things are getting more, like it's, we're able to talk about things that probably 20 years ago was not okay to talk about. Um, give, you, feel, give an example. Uh, Uh, the same thing as uh, there are not many women in the music industry, in the technical side. Mm -hmm. Is it changing? I think there's a big drive. Um, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, drive in education at the moment. There's a lot of um, campaigns. Um, a colleague of mine um, has recently done a um, course for um, women in London, um, and it was to do with getting. Um, more women into the music industry and more women from different backgrounds. Um, I think there's more awareness uh, and I think that's a really good start. I do still sometimes, you know, I do still sometimes hear stories from, you know, I've got quite a few female colleagues um, and we've had two people working for Bright. Flora and Roxanne, who, who both started with um, intern, well, Roxanne started with an internship with us and then came to work with us as a design assistant. And Flora joined us directly um, after university. There's a, a couple of other women who, who we've worked with as, as freelancers. And some of the stories I've heard about attitudes at their universities did shock me. You know, this is in the last five years and they've had tutors saying to them, you know, do not go into rock and roll, do not go into live music. You need to stay in theatre because, you know, there's no place for women in, in... And I just think, my God, those attitudes are so archaic and outdated. Do, do you think that's really like the starting point of not having a lot of uh, women in live music because that's the attitude at in, 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 in college? I think if you imagine you're a student who might have aspirations to, to come into this sector, but you don't have contacts. So you don't have the contacts we have because you've not been out working mm -hmm. and you're... Your contact is your tutors and the people within your educational institute. And if they have that mentality, that's not a good start. No. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. you're, not, you're not getting past that. And also you need role models. You need examples. You need to say, okay, I can look into this, this sector and I can see people like me who are successfully doing this job and, and enjoying it. And that then inspires other people to take that route. Absolutely. When you look into a sector and you, all you see is people who are, who are not like you at all from a completely different background, you feel like maybe it's not accessible for you or maybe it's, it's kind of intimidating, I guess. Or Yeah, so but do you think that there's a lot of young uh, women or, that are interested but that are just like afraid of going into the business? Do you think that's the situation? Um, I think there's certainly um, a considerable number of young women who are pursuing further and higher education in music technology, lighting, theatre, performance, and would like to come and work into the sector. Um, and with the kind of correct support and guidance, they would be fantastic mm -hmm. um, colleagues to have working with us. And, you know, if, if we work hard to give people opportunities and support them and bring them in, then, you know, we can expect to see a more diverse workforce, but I think it has to come from both sides. You know, people have to be open to it and open to give opportunities and not have this attitude of, um, you know, we don't want a female rigor or we don't want a woman running power because, you know, you should be in catering. You know, that, that just has to go. 
and it's yeah. it's pretty much gone. Yeah. But you, you still yeah. come across it because you 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 just said that you feel a lot of support. Yes, absolutely. For, yeah. But I've been lucky enough to have uh, a lot of people who've given me opportunities and supported me, and that's meant that when I've come across people who are less open minded, I've been able to just you know, mm -hmm. push that to one side, but it's not always been easy. It, I mean, it never is. And I think you, you, part of, you know, part of those, those situations that I came across in the first few years, you know, I was very young and there weren't very many women certainly working in kind of, um, more localized, um, festivals or, or smaller production companies. So, you, you know, you did come across people who were like, well, you need, to, you need to prove that you're here for the right reasons. You're not just here because you want to hang out backstage. And it's infuriating, but you, yeah. you've worked bloody hard for it. And actually it pays off because by the time you get to the point where you are on the road, you've sort of already overcome certain attitudes and certain preconceptions that are yeah, sort of yeah, not yeah. important anymore. You're just like... So, but you do think it's still is a little bit or a lot harder for a woman to get where you are than it would be for a man or is that just too black and white? I think that's statement? too, I think it's a very black and white statement. Um, you're going to have to work hard. And I think, you know, any younger or any woman, doesn't matter age, is irrelevant. Anybody coming into the industry, regardless of gender, race or background, has to work hard. We've, we've all been there. I agree it's, with that completely. Mm -hmm. It's hard work. Yeah. And I think you will get people who just, you know, it, it doesn't suit them. You know, they don't want to work late nights and weekends. They don't want to be pulling 80 hour weeks because they can get, you know, a more yeah, comfortable yeah. lifestyle elsewhere. And, and, you know, people need to go through those initial kind of months and years of, of doing the crazy shifts and yeah. the hard graft and decide whether it's for them. Um, but I, I have always felt like, there shouldn't be any exception. You know, man or woman, you, you just, to any girl coming in, don't expect to be treated differently because you're female. Just crack on. Just work yeah. as hard as everybody else. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 There's still some, um, yeah. I really hope that, uh, that the, the industry opens up for young, young women. And to get the macho side uh, side of it uh, out of it, and that yeah, young people who love doing it are not afraid of coming in. No, I think. But, so. but uh, yeah, you have the light side. But do you know uh, on the video or sound side a lot of not like, many, absolutely not, not many, few, yeah. but only a few. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think there's more more people coming in, but not enough. Yeah, and yep. Yeah. I like what you said about education and it needs to start there because I agree with that. But do you think we, we, or in general need to campaign more actively for that and, or yeah, that's maybe a hard question. But, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, you know, it's important. Um, so I want to kind of articulate myself as well <laughs> as possible in my answer. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about some of the, you know, for instance, I was called some years ago by somebody who was trying to put together an all-woman crew for a tour. You know, a band wanted a completely female crew. I fundamentally have a problem with that because I, I don't think that's dealing with the problem in a balanced way. I think that's, you know, a knee-jerk reaction. There aren't enough women, so let's... And actually, I ended up having a conversation with the tour manager who was struggling to find a lighting operator who had experience in projection. And we'd gone through a list of women who had the appropriate skill set, but none of them were available for this tour. And it got to a point of saying, you know, this is becoming, you know, you're going to end up with somebody who's not qualified for the job based on gender just because you want a woman in that job. Mm. You know, it, yeah. Yeah. there aren't as many women doing it. So therefore you are picking from a smaller pool. And it, yeah. for me, it, that that's just not helpful. But what is helpful is getting rid of those um, or pushing aside or educating away from those attitudes of, you know, you don't belong here or mm -hmm. the stereotypes of if you're a woman working in touring, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And my God, I've come ac across that. And it's insulting. It's Absolutely deeply it's insulting. insulting. I do it because I do it for the reasons you do it. I'm yeah. passionate about live music and I've worked my bloody ass off yeah. to get here. Yeah. I've not done it because... 
you know, I've had a relationship with a musician that's got me a job on the road, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it, it makes you, me did angry. Did you ever have a relationship with a, uh, I don't a know. Musician, no. <laughs> yeah, with a musician, no. With a musician, no. Gossip, though. <laughs> Gossip, <laughs> though. <laughs> no, never? No. No, no, no but if, if I understand correctly, it's, it's not black and white, but we should more or less actively be doing something about it or... Yeah, um, yeah. what could we do about it? I think we could be um, more... Maybe we need to make the first step. Maybe we need to run... When you say campaigns, maybe those campaigns need to be educational, not just about women, yeah. but going into colleges and, you know, getting in earlier. I didn't know... Why did, why did I start in audio? Because I didn't know lighting was a job. I had no mm. idea. I think I was a year in, you know, I didn't know what a lighting designer did. I just knew that I loved live music and I wanted to be a part of this, whatever this yeah. was. So maybe if you go in a bit earlier and you, you say, okay, and I don't know about here, but there's a big campaign in the UK at the moment to get girls from a much younger age into science and maths and to really push those STEM subjects and get, you know, key stage two girls, sort of eight years old, nine years old into, you know, this is not, for the boys and you, you should be doing the arts, girls should be doing science as well. And maybe it needs to start back there. And we need to be, you know, in middle bar, we need to be saying to people, okay, these are jobs that are out there and they're real mm -hmm. jobs. They're not jobs mm -hmm. that people perceive to be kind of fun jobs that aren't taking life seriously. These are real serious jobs. From early on. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you need to be good at science and you need to be good at maths or you need to have good project management skills. Or you need to have good interpersonal communication skills, web design, CAD. You know, there's there's loads of really valid, really transferable skills that are really important to our sector. And perhaps um, it's the perception that, you know, it's kind of cool and shiny and you might want to hang out on stage at festivals. It's just not giving the right message to people that this is... Yeah, <laughs> no. absolutely. But I think... I think that's well, that's, uh, that's also yeah, very important. Yeah, it's very important. <laughs> that's, that's a problem with the whole sector, not only for women, but the audience doesn't actually know what happens. They come to no. a show, they hear something and they see something and they think it's 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 cool and it's nice, but they don't know how much work there was before and after the show. Nobody nobody just no. knows and yeah, but that's that's in life. That's that's with a lot of things. Eh? If you play a computer game, you're, you're just like ah, a nice yeah, game, but yeah, you don't yeah. you don't know how how much effort uh, or or if you watch a movie, it's like ah, oh, nice yeah. movie. Yeah, but people spend yeah that's years true. of, of yeah. their life. So yeah, yeah. Is it is it important that we have more kind of career exposure for our sector, or then do you end up in a situation which? I think, sorry, a situation that I think <laughs> happened a little bit of, of seen at home, which was you've got suddenly loads of college courses training people in production skills, but there aren't the jobs. So you can't, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's got to be in line with what's available. There's no point in having like loads of music management courses if... Yeah, or you got people that aren't passionate about it because they just looked for something to study and yeah. ended up They want to be a DJ, so they do music Yeah, production. they're just not cut mm, yeah. out for the lifestyle at yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, because I think, or, or the life circuit, it's, it's absolutely more important to be passionate about it because of the strange and long hours, the weekend work. I, th yeah, I, think, it's, I think it's more important to be passionate about it than... A normal nine to five job. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's a lifestyle, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lifestyle yeah. choice and you've, it's got to be really, you know, something that you love. Otherwise, you quite quickly fall out of, <laughs> <laughs> fall out of favor with it. Hey, Kate, so um, at some point you moved to Antwerp. Oh, yeah. Can we talk about, uh, should, should we talk about that for a... Uh, Tell, what can you tell about that? Why didn't you move to Ghent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I came here in 2012. Um, I came here for love, which is a good reason for moving for many people, I think. When, you, yeah. when people say, why did you change country? So for love. And they go, oh, of uh, course. Yeah, it's love or work. I suppose it was a bit of both as well. You know, um, I wouldn't have um, I wouldn't have ended up in Belgium if it wasn't for the fact that I was 
visiting so frequently with work. So, you know, coming through for festivals and for shows and, you know, kind of fell in love with like the lifestyle a little bit. I think before I moved, I didn't really know the cities per se, like I knew the yeah. venues and I knew the festivals <laughs> yeah, really well. Yeah. But like my perception of Antwerp before I started visiting the city was the flyovers outside Lotto Arena. <laughs> like literally yeah. that was it. Yeah, I've been to Antwerp, I've got off the bus and I've walked into Lotto yeah. and I've spent a day in there and then I've got back on the bus and I've left again. Like I never had a day off, you know, I had some time in Brussels. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, when life brought me here, um, yeah, I was really keen to move. I was really, really happy to move. And it was really lovely to be moving to a country where I'd had such positive experiences through work and then starting to discover the cities um, and getting to know more and more people who perhaps I'd sort of crossed paths with, you know, when touring or at a festival, but never really mm -hmm. gotten to know beyond, you know, that sort of transient lifestyle we live. It was like, yeah, it was a, it was a really easy decision for me to make. It was an easy decision? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. I would really think that it would be a difficult one because <laughs> leaving your... Yeah, yeah leaving... UK scene and... Yeah, and yeah. Your, yeah. leaving your UK scene mm. eh, and leaving your yeah, home country. And you know. uh, connections but and friends and like moving to us. Also, yeah. Yeah. Is the fact that you did already a lot of touring at that point made that the yeah. whole thing easier? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So I'd, I'd left the West Country, southwest of England, we fondly refer to as the West Country. I'd left two years previous and I was living just outside London with some close friends. But at that period in my life, I was spending all my time on tour. So, you know, my home was really a, a base to, you know, Storage stop. Room. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Just, to stop between, between jobs. Um, and I didn't really have a connection with that town. I was living with my best friend who, you know, I've, I've known since I was 12 years old. Um, and we're still very close, uh, but it, it wasn't, I wasn't living in an area where I had a huge friendship group or family social network. It was, um, it was, it was a transient period in my life where that was a, a very convenient place to be based close to London. And, you know, my, my very dear friend had, had bought her first house. So I was, you know, renting the spare room off them. It was a win-win situation yeah, for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, you know, when I um, decided, you know, when I got into a relationship and decided to move to Belgium, um, I was like ready for a new adventure, really. Yeah. I just, I'd spent so much time touring in Europe. I'd already kind of like floated the idea in my head quite a lot about what happens if I move to the Netherlands or if I move here or Germany, th those are all, you know, at one point I talked about moving to Paris just because um, I was working on some projects and it, it was really, you know, I was playing with the idea. I was like, I'd just quite like to have a new adventure and I'd quite like to, you know, go and try living somewhere else tu for a bit. Peu, uh, tu parles un peu français? Uh, un petit peu. <laughs> D'accord. <laughs> so, and uh, looking back at these eight years in Belgium, has it been a, the, yeah, how, how does it feel now? Is it, or are you like... Home. It, yeah? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Would you still, or, or are you, is, is there a plan? Would you consider moving to Paris? Or are you now more like, this is Antwerp is home? <laughs> no, no, it's... it's yeah, uh, no, I don't know. Like, um, I'm sort of, for, for me and my point of view and, and career-wise... I'm really happy here. Um, whether I stay in Antwerp or whether I end up, you know, in, in years to come moving to another part of Belgium, I don't know. We'll see what happens really. Yeah. Um, currently it's, it's great. I've got a fantastic group of friends in Antwerp. I've, I've been there long enough now that I really, you know, I feel very at home there. Um, you know, if a, a job opportunity came up, what would you do? Would you, would you move to, you know, Geneva for instance? And I was like, well, you know, I'm open to anything really. Um, I don't know. I, I've I've never been one to have a fixed plan in life. You know what I mean? I'm not yeah, like, all yeah, yeah. oh, right, by the time I'm 40, I need to have done this. And by the time I'm 45, I need to have done this. Like, no, let's just, you You're know. happy here for the time being. Happy and, uh, here. I could see myself living here, retiring here and staying here. I'm also aware that, you know, I've got a lot of friends and, and, and you know, my mum's still in the UK. Um, you know, there might be a point where, I, you know, decide that it's it's better to to move closer to home. We just have to see, really. 
does it have a, an impact on your work, like on Bright or on anything that you're not London based or England based um, anymore? We we find that yeah, yes and no. Um, in short, uh, the whole team at Bright's quite spread out. Um, but they're not all in Birmingham, for instance. So um, we've we've all been in different locations. So we've we we were quite used to working on Teams and Zoom before this year. It was always about remote working, and we had the office space as a place to kind of come together and work on projects. Uh, we do quite a lot of projects for clients in the US as well as Europe. So, you know, you, you, it doesn't really make any difference where you are as long as you've got an internet connection. I did find over the last few years that I was commuting to the UK a lot and that was quite tiring because obviously, you know, you're running a company and you've got a lot of responsibilities there. Um, so, you know, I became very familiar with the Brussels, Birmingham route. Yeah, but hey, what, what it. is it? Uh, <laughs> Brussels, Birmingham, door to door. What would that be? Like About four you, hours, five hours. If you, if you leave eight at eight o'clock in Antwerp, I'll where? be there just after lunch. Really? Mm. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, mm. yeah, it is okay. Yeah, that's okay. But if you have to do it every week or every two weeks, I I I think that that can be. It wears thin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's why they invented the internet. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but actually, guys, I'm not. Uh, want to sound like as an old dinosaur or something, but it's crazy that you have a company in Birmingham, but yeah, you live in Antwerp. Eh? Yeah. Can you, if you tell that to people 20 years ago, they would, or 30 years, <laughs> I would say, what, what, uh, what's wrong with you? Yeah, they still do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They still do. They're like, what is wrong with you? Just move to Birmingham. Yeah, but it's like, but, but have you been to Birmingham? Antwerp's way cooler. It's way better. Uh, yeah, nice. Eh? Hey, that, I think yeah. that's that's. Uh, an, How do you think, how has uh, the whole uh, Brexit thing impacted you? Yeah. <laughs> Should have put that on the... Um, um, uh, did, it, did it impact you? Well, yes, it's absolutely going to impact us. And I think the, the frustration Good is question, that... question, by the way, Peter. Yeah, the frustration is, it's what, what is it today? The 22nd of December. Mm -hmm. We are eight days away from yeah. B-Day, if you want to call it that. We don't know. And that's just ridiculous. Like the government has been all like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's all ready to go and it's going to be really simple and we're going to, you know, oven ready plan. Nobody knows and it's next week. Now, and the current COVID situation doesn't help as well because... Uh, it's an absolute uh, mess. Uh, yeah. It's chaos. And, you know, you can't plan for it. Like I was having conversations with um, my accountant here a year and a half ago saying, okay, you know, what do we need to do with my company here and then the company in the UK? And, and he's honestly saying to me, I can't advise you because we don't know what's happening with Brexit. And everybody's just been in this three-year kind of hiatus of going, well, until somebody decides what this actually means, nobody can really make a plan. And then you throw COVID on top of that, which yeah, has got, you yeah. know, like we don't know what's going to happen next year anyway. It's, it's an absolute mess. Yeah, it worries me. <laughs> a yeah, bit. I can imagine. The, the, the cross point I, I, in, the, in the newspaper this morning it was like the cross point of Brexit and COVID is now Dover. It's called. That was the title on <laughs> Yeah, but they, they. Yeah, but have you seen the literally? It's, yeah. It's, have you seen the situation chaos. there? Yeah. But it's it's absolute chaos. Hey, but I feel so pity for all these. But yeah, that has nothing to do with the podcast. But the situation of these truck drivers now. Yeah three days before Christmas being stuck and not it. Can you imagine? I, well, anyway. No, it's, 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 a, and it's funny enough. I got my letter today from the Belgium government telling me, you know, finally got my letter today saying, you're a British citizen who lives here. This is what you need to do. And thankfully it's a really, you um, got it today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thankfully, I don't yeah. need to do a lot. Right in time. <laughs> but it, it, and it's quite, they're, they're keeping it quite simple. You know, if you're, if you're here and you're established and you, you have a residence permit, it's quite, you know, a simple process to switch it. But it, it has bothered me in the last two years because you're like, I've, you know, I've built a life here. Is someone yeah. going to turn around and say, oh, sorry, can I have your residence permit back? Because you just don't know. It's horrible. Yeah. So, no. Is there uh, in, in, in the production companies that you know in, in England or tour managers or whatever what? Huh? Is there a, a sort of panic at the moment? Like, Jesus, what is going to happen next summer? How are we going to do this? How are we going to be able to... Uh, do you have have you have you spoken to people about it or uh, I think I mean it's it's tricky isn't it because if you asked if this if we were in this situation without 
what's happened this year with COVID, there probably would be a different feeling because we would be, um, you know, what are we doing about the tour that's happening in, in January? And we are concerned. What if we need carnets for every country? What if we need visas? You know, all of those things that have been questions for the last couple of years. Um, I suppose the fact that currently there are no tours going out, maybe... <laughs> It helps. <laughs> it helps. Makes it easier. <laughs> Simplifying that a little bit. But, it's a, it's yeah. a pretty diabolical situation. <laughs> but, it, you know, yeah, we, we, we are going to have a little bit of time to go, okay, what, what does this mean? Um, obviously, no tour manager or production manager, so they, they, they'll have a completely different outlook on it. But it, it's just... It's going to be a mess. Yeah, of course. Way, yeah, I mean, look that, at that, that. That's for sure. That's... It, it, if nothing else, it's just going to make everything a lot harder. At, at best, it's just going to involve a shitload of more paperwork yeah. and uh. hassle. You know, mm. go and do a festival tour. I, yeah. 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 I, yeah but, time will tell. It's, it's, it's so yeah, crazy it's, that we're we're just sitting here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We yeah, don't. Know. Yeah. We don't know. It's happening next <laughs> we don't week. know. It, but it's just that, like normal, like going. Uh, on uh, going to to the UK and back, it's yeah, in a yeah. normal situation yeah, that we do it every uh, UK bands do it every weekend. Yeah, eh? and I think yeah. what, your question before, which is is really interesting with this year, it's like, okay, is it weird having a company in the UK and living here? Um, it's not always easy, but it's completely doable, and we've done it for for quite some time. But I've absolutely taken for granted the fact that I can get back to the UK like that. You know, I can get in my car and drive. I can take the ferry. I can take, take a train. train. I can yeah. take a train from Brussels. I can fly out of Antwerp or Brussels or Amsterdam. It, it's I've never, ever felt in the time I've lived here, I can't go home. Mm -hmm. Even though I consider this home, but, you know, I can't go back to where my mother lives. I can't go back and see family or friends or anything like that. I've always felt, okay, it's, it's you know, even in the middle of the night, if there's an emergency, I get in my car, I drive to Calais. And I just take a boat. It's fine. And this year has been the first time where it's like, no, you can't. You, it's only there, but you, you can't go. You, there's no, the mm -hmm. borders are shut. And that's been a weird switch. Yeah, absolutely. You feel suddenly like, oh, right. And also it's difficult because you don't know what is going to happen. If you know what was going to happen, yeah. then, then, then you know you can prepare more or less for it. Mm. But the fact that you don't know what's going to happen. No, or best how guess. Will, yeah. You know, we started receiving letters in the last six weeks from banks saying, you need to close your accounts. You need to close your accounts um, and move to another bank because we're no longer servicing overseas customers. You know, it starts with that. And then other huh? banks. Ex ex explain that. I don't, what, what, so, 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 I mean, <laughs> some, some of the banks, because of the, the change in regulation, because it's, it, they'll know UK will no longer be part of the EU, um, it makes it more difficult, as I understand it, for the banks to, or more costly to have um, clients in certain EU states. And it's different for each high street bank. But for instance, some of the banks, because of the, the different tariffs or the different regulations, yeah. they're stopping supporting customers in certain countries. So for instance, my bank that I've been with since I was 16 contacted me last month and said, you need to close all your accounts by mid-January and find another bank, sorry, because we're no longer servicing Belgium. And then other high street banks are servicing Belgium, but not the Netherlands. And it's... It's a mess. It's an yeah. absolute mess. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. Wow. Yeah. I mean, luckily, I'm, I'm actually quite grateful that it's, you know, I feel for people who aren't in this situation, but I'm quite grateful this is happening at a time where I've been here long enough to be pretty yeah. settled. Because if you were in the middle of moving here and then oh, yeah. your yeah. entire yeah. life in the UK was going, right, you need to close everything and, you know, pick pick where you're going to be. It's it's not easy, but hopefully it'll settle. Hey, uh, how has the... Uh this strange year uh, uh, how, how has it been for 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 you and for bright were you guys able to uh, shift a little bit and uh, do some streams yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. was it okay have you have you how have you been uh, it's been difficult been, it's yeah? been really difficult yeah i mean we probably like many other people we uh, saw most of our work cancel or um Uh, get postponed um, in the first few weeks after everything kicked off in March and um, so that was scary you know we had we had, we had a busy summer like I'm sure like most people we had a lot a lot of projects due to kick off um, March onwards so March through August was was pretty booked up um, we 
I had some bits and pieces in the summer, some streaming work. Um, but I mean, you know, we, we went from having a busy schedule to Nothing a, compared to yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've, you know, been working on some other other projects, you know, um, to try and diversify a little bit and adjust to the current situation. So um, seeing a lot of interest in mixed reality, in streaming. Um, my business partner, Mike, is... Um, involved in some software development at the moment which hopefully will um bring some some more possibilities in the new year when it launches in january you know we're, we're trying to find other ways to use our resources and our skills but the it, it's hard yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I don't know about how it is for you but perfect no problem <laughs> Podcast. I, I, I think the the base is that it's the same for us. We, yeah, of course. For everybody, we try to use our skills in other directions and try to see what's possible. But the thing, the thing is, you do your, you live your life uh, or our lifestyle. Yeah, it's in, it's what we do. It's just, it's more than just our job. But if you, yeah, you, you, you you're passionate about you, it. Yeah, but, and but that's that's your life, and that's your reality and that's all the people you know and and yeah. uh, that's you you're completely into this bubble eh? mm. as um but then yeah this reality stops and then people say yeah do something else but that's not so not that's so not easy. Not, that's, that's not, not easy it, it's because you have to learn a new skill but also uh, uh, learn a new reality or or yeah, and starting a new all, network and look it's for uh, new interests or or yeah, but even even if it doesn't interest you, eh, and if it's just like a job or something, yeah, for me it's difficult to to switch to selling cars. I yeah. I don't know anything about it, cars. I don't know anybody in the car business. So you where, where do I start? About I, I, yeah, it, like we've dedicated a, a significant amount of time into learning our skills and our trade yeah. and sector and, and building businesses within that. And a big part of our lives, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. And it, it is daunting. I mean, I'm, I, I try and be pragmatic about it. You know, okay, there are people who are much worse off and we are lucky to have had a career and have a career doing something we love. It's not a given, you know, we're not entitled to this. Sure. We're lucky to have it. So therefore it sucks, but sometimes you have to, you know, adjust and work around the situation. But when people just say, oh yeah, just retrain. That's, that's like, that's a significant, you know, to, to retrain seriously in another career, you're looking at at least three years of going back into education, potentially yeah, mm -hmm. to, to even begin. And also when you run a business, it's small business or, or a larger business, or, you know, you have a certain, you know, your life is structured to the lifestyle we've had with with the work we've been doing in events you know i'm i'm more than happy to go and get any job i can find if i need to i don't think i'm above anything i will do whatever it takes but the reality is most jobs i could go out and get now aren't going to pay my mortgage you know because mm -hmm. i don't have a diploma in in you mm. know another yeah. career you know i've put all my energy into this so you know if i go yeah and but and, but even if you if you yeah you're like a designer right so you work in the global entertainment business eh? in your situation. It's not like, oh, the music uh, industry is having a problem at the moment. Yeah, I'm going to design something else. Yeah, what? Are you going to work for a football company, for example? Yeah, <laughs> they, they're they also not doing anything. No, it's no. like, yeah, we, we, like we, we, we are shifting. Eh? Uh, we are shifting. We, we, we're, we're starting other things. Eh? And at the end of the day, when everything kicks back in, I think we'll be stronger. Yeah. But now it's really like, yeah. Uh, because it, it's also not simple because in 2019, we were at the top of our game. We were really good in what we were doing. And if you have to look for new things, you're never there because you have to start all over yeah. again. And that step is, that's a really big leap to get to. That's, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And it, bridging that gap is the, and, and also I'm, I'm sure it's the same for many people, but if, if you had a, if it was finite, like if there was a roadmap and it said, okay, right, guys, 2021 is going to be a write-off. It sucks, but 2022, January, we're going to do shows at 50% capacity. March, so for instance, at least you'd be able to say, okay, 
I know what I'm working towards. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know that I've got to get my yeah, business through right. another 12 months yeah. and, and find a way. And then I can expect this and this and this. But at the moment, we're just like looking into the great Pure. unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it, yeah. The, yeah. The uncertainty or the, the, the thing like, I still remember beginning of March uh, this year, we were like, I had a conversation with the... Uh, 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 with, with Jan, I think, or with Steiner, I don't know. Like, oh, hey, they're going to do a, a little lockdown né, uh, for three weeks. But uh, there's a Lotto Arena show we're at the end of Still April. Uh, <laughs> uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Hey, it's nice. <laughs> we, we were, I think, like, yeah, three, three week holiday. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, because and then, oh, you, shit. You no, th called, this is. You even called me for a show in May, or I think. It's like, oh, shit. Then. Yeah, this yeah. is going wrong. But hey, summer, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. We were the same. We were like, glass, we'll be back for glass yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, no problem about no, it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, okay, but then it keeps shifting. Hey, now today I heard, and I don't want to be negative, but I heard they're thinking about not reopening the uh, bars and restaurants before the 15th of March. Eh? Really? Yeah. I heard April for the UK. <laughs> it's like... this <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't don't, go there anyway. But, yeah. but, uh, we, we don't, we, we don't oh, go right. into neg negativity, but yeah, right. that's, that's, yeah, that's difficult. That's, that, eh? Yeah, but that's reality right now. Yeah. That's just... Yeah, absolutely. Because we're looking for solutions, I, or I have the impression we're looking for solutions, but yeah, we're not looking, we're looking for solutions for a month or, or yeah. two months, but yeah. we're not... Yeah. I can't imagine... If, if we don't do a... S I, I, I really think that we're going to have something as a festival summer next summer. I re Today, I still believe that. Yeah, I really hope so. I mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. hope so. We all do. Yeah, I think we all do. And I think there will be something. It's not going to be back to normal. Absolutely not. I think, yeah. I, I think we all know that. It's not going to be back to normal. There will be something, I think, but it's not going to be back to normal. No, absolutely not. I do think like, that, you know, I hope... This is the optimism coming through. I hope that, you know, there will be some positives in it. And, you know, you talk about the remote working and stuff that perhaps, you know, when we do come through this, we'll understand better, you know, what the, what we can do remotely, where the limitations are. You know, I, I think previous there was a, a, a lot of travel I did for, for meetings, for instance, and for planning wasn't always necessary, but you felt that if you didn't, you know, if you, if you said, oh, just, can I just, can I just log in on Zoom? You'd be considered as not a serious party, you know, not yeah. really taking the project seriously. Whereas I, I do wonder whether after this, we'll see a world where people will be much more realistic about going, there is no need to spend the time and the money and, and the environmental impact of getting on a plane mm -hmm. and going there for a meeting and coming back yeah. again, you know, and we will be more efficient in how we yeah. um, travel and yeah, spend absolutely. our time. But I, I'm, 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 I'm com Absolutely sure that uh, this thing will change our our work nice forever. Uh, yeah, for, in a forever. certain it's way, for sure. yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. No I remember. That. I, I remember that I had to go to a meeting in Brussels uh, on the fifteenth of March for a now one hour meeting uh, with a, with a band, and uh, yeah, there there was COVID was starting, and they sent me a, a link. Or did I already tell it? But they no. sent me a link, like a Zoom link. I've never heard of Zoom before <laughs> the fifteenth of March. I'm like, what was this? But now we're eight months later. It's like Zoom. Yeah, I don't love it, of course. <laughs> yeah. But it's so efficient. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. We, we have a meeting at nine. Yeah, everybody's there. I don't have to drive into Antwerp, lose three, four hours. It's just like, yeah, we do the meeting. Yeah. And it's done. Yeah. So, yeah. Is that a positive thing? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But, I uh, think it is. Um, yeah. No. I think we go, we're, we're going back to a combination of the two things. Because meeting in person will be still important, yeah. but a lot of the meetings will occur, I hey, think. But online. for our business, do you think um, maybe that's uh, uh, a site we, we haven't talked about COVID day because we're at uh, the impact? Will now we have more streams eh? and uh, we have like digital festivals and uh, stuff like that? Will, th will this? Do you think, Kay, that this will have an impact impact the uh, on the next couple of uh, years? Like, will streaming be even more important than, uh, uh, yeah, l last year? Uh, I think, I think yes, I think it will. Um, I think what we've seen with the projects we've been involved with this year is it's still very much a new format, and we or the sector, the industry, is finding its feet with that. In that. How do you monetize it? How do you make a good stream? 
mm-hmm. that is interesting. Yeah. And how many, you know, at what point do is the market saturated with watching people perform with no audience? You know, how do you fill yeah. that gap? The thing is also, it never can replace uh, the actual life yeah, but maybe or, or will it maybe will it be a, a side thing? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's okay. really thing. But the, like the Dua Lipa streams. Yeah. Uh, the if you see the figures uh, of how many people um, watched. Yeah. What, what's the other uh, act that the, the, the Billie Eilish? Billie Eilish. Uh, they did. They they hit huge huge viewing figures. And interestingly, I was involved with the project uh, with an artist on the same management. Is Dua Lipa, so it was some of the same team um, who who later did that stream, okay. uh, and we did something in August. And you know, like I say, it's it's a format where we're still finding our way. You know, what works, what do we need to include? You know, we can't just put an artist in a space and film it because actually, is that going to captivate? the interest for an hour? Is that going to justify the ticket price? Do we need to then bring in more narrative, more, you know, staging, more additional, you know, items to make to make this more of like a piece of short film or television rather than just your favourite art act in kind of a cool space playing a gig? And, you know, I think the answer is different depending on the artist and depending on um, the, you know, creative direction for what it is you're trying to do. Another thing, but I've but, but, but it, it will have an impact also on the life uh, on the live uh, experience in the yeah. couple of years because if you if you have seen yeah, this level eh, of digital festivals of, or digital uh, uh, concerts, yeah, there it's getting high level. Eh? Yeah. If you see what tomorrow Tomorrowland is doing, yeah. eh, guys, that's whew. yeah expectations and, uh, the, uh, but, globally. Yeah, globally the expectations of. I think it's it's going to impact the global expectations of 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 life the, uh, of live gigs. The other thing I think we're going to see is like XR is becoming increasingly popular, and, and the possibilities are becoming um, you know are increasing hugely. And my question is, would would we have seen such a quick uptake and a quick development in mixed reality had we had a normal year this year? And I question maybe we wouldn't in live anyway, because people would have been busy doing tours and, and live shows. Yeah, definitely. And because everybody's been stopped, we're now going, okay, what about if we start looking at film world and what if we start looking at other things we can do with the technology? And, it, it, and potentially these things are going to develop more quickly than they would have done otherwise, which is yeah. interesting. Absolutely. Maybe that's that's an interesting thing like a to, to, look, to look forward to, yeah. because that will be the new evolution. Possibly. And also, you know, we, we did a couple of streams this summer where it was um, TV performances, like a like single coming out, going to a US TV show. Now, previously, the artist would have gone out to the US and done their TV promo. But it turns out that it's just as effective to set up in a theatre in London, yeah, yeah, yeah. film it okay. and send it to the TV company. <laughs> okay. So yeah. as much as we'll never replace touring in the live gig, will we find ourselves yeah. in a situation where... We're not flying a halfway around the world to do a TV appearance, but we're also yeah. creating more work in our home yeah. cities to produce these shows at home, which yeah, actually absolutely. would be beneficial, I think, for everybody. I think maybe that's a good note to uh, to end to, to, to finish. <laughs> yeah. I just have I just no, I just have one yeah, sure. last question actually. <laughs> if you could give the golden tip to a young Kate Carter when she started. What would it be? Don't do it. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Not the live music. <laughs> Stay in sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, a young me. Yeah. Okay. A young me, I think, would be um, to follow your heart and not be afraid to make those decisions. You know, not 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 be afraid to make the big decisions. Okay. Okay, that's, that's a, a good that's, thing. Yeah. Absolutely, that's a, <laughs> is that too cryptic? No, 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 no <laughs> absolutely not. That's a, a really. I was thinking a, like, whoa, uh, yeah. <laughs> a beautiful sentence to uh, Bram. To what would be with? your tip for the young yeah. young Bram? Uh, I'll think about it for the next podcast. <laughs> no, I already asked you once. And you said, uh, <laughs> I already. Peter answered it. Uh, all right, but uh, hey. Um, are we are we still in into our ninety minutes uh, goal? Absolutely not. not. Right. No. <laughs> we try. I told you guys, hey, she's <laughs> she's gonna talk. <laughs> so no, uh, Kate, uh, thank you very very much uh, for the podcast here. Been it was a very interesting. Having... Absolutely, it was a thank you for having honor, me. Uh, an honor for having you. Um, 
Frank, Bram, uh, alweer bedankt. Hey, ik, vind wel dat, ik vind wel dat Kate, uh, Kate moet het afsluiten in het Nederlands. Oké. Okay. Ja. Ja. Thanks for listening. Ja. See you next time. Ja, yeah, dus, so you're going to say in Dutch, uh, yeah, uh, this was a very nice evening. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, see you next time. Um, dit was een heel leuke avond. Dankjewel om te luisteren. Um, dankjewel om mee te hier hebben voor de uitnodiging. En uh, tot de volgende keer.